G'day folks, talk to Damien Tomlinson, an Australian Army veteran and adaptive golfer, internationally ranked. And we talk about his rise through the Australian Army ranks and where he served as a commando in various operations around the globe and one particular operation in Afghanistan where there was a traumatic event and which led to loss of limbs. And we talk about that and we talk about the rehabilitation process, what it was like living as someone with an acquired disability, the ups and downs, and then life after it. And then having a crack, rising up in the Invictus Games, serving Australia, and then having to go at other sports like snowboarding and just with golf. Like golf's hard enough for anyone to swing a club, let alone someone that's lost limbs, like has to learn to adapt to that disability and then bringing golf in the equation, man, he's having a red hot crack. And where he starred in various films and one in particular, Hacksaw Ridge, directed by Mel Gibson, putting the army suit back on, how that felt, was it awkward? And just an all-around great guy and where he's trying to strive and be better for himself and the people around him. On the disability front, on the Australian Army front and where he brings that together. Solid. And if you like the podcast, hit that subscribe button. It'd be much appreciated. And if you want to help even further, become a patron. I've got a Patreon page. Link below. Check it out. I want to thank our sponsors, Permanbill Australia. Greatest electric wheelchairs in the land. Wouldn't be sitting in anything else but these four wheels right here. And they've got great assistive tech also. So righto, let's get into it. Damien Tomlinson, thanks for coming down, brother, jumping on the podcast and having a yarn. Thanks for getting us on, Jay. Appreciate it, man. Brother, so just... Tell us a little bit about where you're from, because I thought you're from Sydney, but then you're up this way on the coast, or what? Yeah, ter- I grew up at Terrigal, mate. So yeah, I was class of '99, Terrigal Primary, Terrigal High School, and then when I was probably 22 or 23, and I've always been pretty ambitious with stuff I've done. I just wanted something more. I found you know options were a little bit limited around here so I sort of started looking at, at different things that I could do or how I could do it you know I sort of yeah and I, I couldn't really find a job that matched my sense of self-worth you know and really something that challenged me yep to a new level so I um I, I went to dad first because that's the place you go and yeah he uh, which is really ironic in a way because I hadn't listened to him for 23 years prior <laughs> to that and then I was ready to just blindly follow whatever he said and he literally just said well, get nothing for you mate like you know I wanted to be an architect I'm not I'm like you work in IT dad yeah you know and he's like well no one can really tell you what you wanted to do they said I didn't have the right math scores and now I've got a master's in applied science so <laughs> Thanks for coming. Yeah, so I ended up looking at the, the computer. I had the picture of my granddad was next to it, and it just – I was I love war doc- documentaries. I yep. just – I like watching them. They're just interesting. And um, there was a lot of stuff on the on the TV about, like, Iraq 1. It would have been at that stage. And I, um, I just looked and thought I'll peruse over the Army site. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it ended up um, – I looked at a thing that was direct entry into the Special Forces and – from there, I saw that was my that was my thing. It sort of yeah. So that's interesting, and just going straight for the special forces. So, were there any other commitments that inspired you? Because that's a pretty big commitment, like going into the army and you know giving yourself to the Australian Army and what that means and what it represents and the commitments that you put in as an individual and where that can take you. But where was some of the inspiration from when 
before you were looking at what you were talking about on the net or looking at brochures and seeing, yeah, the army this and the army that and more docos, like, was it purely what you seen on TV or? Uh, to, be inter- to be honest, man, like looking back at it, I think, you know, because there's stuff that's that's sitting on the surface and then there's stuff I think that everyone's got that sits that little bit back sort of behind the front. I think deep down mm. I didn't really like where I was and where I was going. Like I had a pretty good plan. With I was originally, you know, it was going to be university and sort of following dad's footsteps. My sister did that and then I just kind of went sideways. In sort of year 10 and 11 at school, I started to just drift in a different direction and I ended up not really paying enough attention in the, like the HSC and stuff. And I think deep down, I don't know, I just, there was something that, it's a slippery slope, I think, when you lose those simple things of those little bits of dedication and motivation that you mm. need to be able to achieve something. You know, when you start slipping, like all of a sudden, you drop one standard, all of a sudden you've dropped all of them. Mm. You know, you've just totally dropped the ball. And I yeah. found I was doing that. So the army to me looked like, and that age too, yeah? Like yeah. when you're losing some of that perspective. Yeah, you're just sort of, you know, happy and then you you see like other people who are in that spot and there's no real life plan or what they're doing. And what I saw in the army was the exact antidote. You know, I sort of saw the counter to everything that I was doing really badly or thing, reasons why I wasn't really proud of where I was and what I was doing. You know, I, I sort of saw all that being... You know, it was that was the type of discipline that I think I needed, and it mm. gave me a good reason to be disciplined. You know, it's really easy, especially when you're like 22 and 23, to go, "Oh, I don't care, man. We're yeah. just we're just gonna go out and drink because it doesn't really matter. We just mm. go to work on Monday, and that's the way it is." Like I knew that that wagon wasn't one that was leading in a good way. It's not often that you go down to like a pub or something like that mm. and look at the guy who's there every single day. You know, and go... There's a lot of those fellas out there. Yeah, you know, I mean, I just... It wasn't something that I aspired to be. Mm. You know, I mean, and I had... Yeah, it was... It was sort of one of those things. I just couldn't see what I wanted out of out of life happening where I was. So something had to change and that's... Plus, I saw, I saw a lifestyle that kind of suited me. I was always a pretty physical guy. I played a, a fair bit of sport and stuff like that, so... Yep. Big parts of that job are being, I always had the brains to do it, you know, it was just the, the physicality, you know, you get, mm. so you basically got to train, you got a reason that you have to train, that you have to work, mm. you have to be healthy. So all these things that I was interested in when I was young, kind of, mm. yeah, or were encapsulated in the one role that just happened to be. That's true. Like wildly dangerous. But yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was... But that mental and physical challenge, like just what that brings, even though the danger element's there, but that's what would spike up the interest too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, and that's sort of, like, I, I really liked it. I loved it. It's just somewhere where you get to, you got to push yourself past, mm. like, every physical level that you thought was anything, you know, like physically you're training and you're just continually notching up. Yeah. You know, and consistently doing it. So the way that it worked was you go... And was training down at Kapuka, down at Wagga? Or? Yeah. So you yeah. do your first your first bit there and then you go to initial employment training, which was at in Singleton at the School of Infantry. Yep. Then we did a two-month bridging course, um, which is basically to give us a little bit of the t- stuff that people would be learning in their first – because typically if you join the Army and they, they'll go, you go to an infantry battalion for 12 months, then you can start applying. They basically did those 12 months in the first two months. And yep. then, you, then you could get panelled for selection and then go on. Panelled for selection for, like, for the commandos? Yeah. Or, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, and then you do, you do the entry test and then they'll yes or no you at the end of that. And then I think we waited a month or two after that and then it was the selection course. Mm. And so was that, like, pretty tricky? Like, when it comes to not just physically what you'd have to do for the challenge but... Like mentally, or do they have a panel that sort of yeah? It's looks all it's you, all mental. Yeah. It's all mental. Like and part of it, part of the psychological side of it, they've already they know that everyone's freaking out that they're always being watched. You know what I mean? So they can yeah. kind of play on it. You know, you've always like a lot of the pressure and stress to do with things. You kind of put on your own shoulders, but part of the job is having 
stresses like that that exist mm. and you being able to function still. You know what I mean? Them not having as much of a physical impact or like a, or a mental impact on you to the point where you freeze or lose yeah. where you are. So, so it's not just physically making you fatigued, but also mentally and just seeing how you operate at yeah. certain levels, yeah? Yeah, and then do you have the right attributes? Like mm. when you get tired, like the first, one of the first things they did was a, it's a 20 kilo march after they've sort of kept you up. You know, so you got like an hour of sleep or something like that, and then you're doing a, a 20 kilometer march with your your 30 odd kilos. I was going to say you'd have your bag on. Yeah, so yeah. you got all that, and then at the end of that, which is it's a long day out. That one, like, I mean, you got to get it done in the the three hours, or whatever it is. Like, it's a building, but then after it, you sort of go through the stage of like, okay, clean up. You've got the next thing, mm. and the next thing we did was our navigation exercise, which is two days where you don't know how many waypoints you need to find so you go find one and what have you got to find have you compass compass or that. that's it yeah so they give okay. you coordinates and then you've basically got to all uh, clues and you basically got to find where these little points are and they've got different things that are written on a piece of paper right and you've got to bring back the answer to whatever question they gave you for it and what's the timeline? How long have you got this sort of cruise? It's 48 hours. Yeah. And they don't tell you how many you need. So in your mind, you're like, I'm not going quick enough. I'm not going quick enough. I don't know. Like, and then you've got one, we had one night That's vision. Extra stress. Monocle, and you're just yeah. like, oh my God, it's day three and I'm going to fail. Like I seriously, I can't find this thing. You go back, you start again. You can't see anything because it's pitch black. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then. Yeah, it's but it's one it's one of those things. Then at the end of it, they give you no feedback. That's one of the things that I think is like it builds that pressure. You're like mm. you zero feedback from anything that you're doing. You know what I mean? There's never yeah, good job. Yeah, right. Well done. No, you've passed. You've failed. So you don't know whether. God, what until right to the end or like? Some people get disciplined through it, or they'll say stuff. So, but some people they'll also do it to see how you react to it. Yeah. You know, how's he dealing under the pressure of this? Can we crack him with that? You they know, want to like, see where the triggers are in you. Yeah. And then go, yeah. okay, cool. How likely is that to affect him working in a team environment? You yeah. know, like let's and, – and a lot of the things, are the tasks, right, you do this thing called demarcation, which is 48 hours where you can't sleep and you can't eat. But you can drink as much water as you want, which – yeah. Water fasting. Yeah. So yeah. essentially what you do is six hour stands and say we're doing it now, we'll go And over. did you have to ration water or you had as much as you want or what? You'd get it at different stages, but okay. that's where, that's sort of where you kind of go with, I think six liters you'd have on you at, at any one time that you'd always want to be bummed up. So anytime you got the chance, you would do it because you never know when you're going to find water again, you know, and that was... But so what we do is we go, we get a group of orders that say, you know, over that hill, there's a chopper that's down, yep. you know, and we have intelligence to get out of it or a pilot that we've got to rescue. We have to get the pilot from there to this location and they'll just give you that on a map and then go, the clock's ticking yeah, and turn and walk. And then in between you, like the group that you've got, you'll have the officer sort of take the lead and go, okay, so what we're going to do is you got to patrol out there because there could be enemy. Sometimes they get the, sometimes they hit you yep, and stuff like that. You've got to react to it, go get it. And typically if it's a pilot, it's a big pile of sandbags on a stretcher. Mm. And now everyone, we have to rotate through and you're all exhausted. Like we have to get him now and he's always got to go, but he's six K's in a horrible direction. And then when you're almost at the end of that 6K yep. thing, there's a part that you can't pass. You know right. what I mean? It's, you're always effectively, you're always set up to fail just so when that yep. stress is on, you got eight guys, so that's all they want to do or how many 12 we had in the teams there. That's all they want to do and they know that they're going to fail the task. Mm. Then you got people just whispering in their ears. You got, are you going to get play, in there? Plant the seeds, yeah. like playing mind games this, and seeing where they can push people. This yeah. pilot is going to die and it was our responsibility to get him out. Mm. What are you guys doing about it? Go. You know, like that sort of stuff that just is. And then and they're all... Well, that's it. If, like, you know, you guys have got to be prepared because if he's in a pressure cooker situation in whatever part of the country or here... 
you know, and there's like a real situation going on, you got to have control, hey. Yeah, it kind of like, but going through that many things, even in the training side of things and stuff, what it does is when when something becomes a high pressure sort of situation that I'm in now, everything slows down. Because most like being physically generally slow and steady only wins the race because it makes the least mistakes you know and that's sort of the thing you don't if you're rushing or you're stumbling or something like guys mm. who are rattling around their weapons trying to get magazines on are so much slower than someone who just smoothly gets it done mm. you know you just see it work over and over again plus if you haven't spent that couple of extra minutes yep. plotting where you have to go and looking what's around it and you just start off you might be the fastest one in a foot race Yep. But you get there last because you've got to recorrect where you're going. Yeah. You know, there's so many of those little bits of perspective that it just kind of stops. Like the panic doesn't help anyone. No. Ever. But how, so. are they, how are they helping you like, build up? Because like some individuals, like they might be just built with that and they can do it straight off the bat. But then there's some individuals that they need to build that up within themselves, like to be calm and not fiddle around with their magazine well that's so. that's typically something that you know pe- people adjust to it you mm. know and the the main thing you want in anyone that's going to work in that sort of environment is they have to be a team player you know everyone everyone can't do everything well mm. you know what i mean like different people will bring different skills to the table you know and you kind of got to work with that and work out where it works you know i mean and ultimately if you're on a battlefield the guy next to you is your best asset you know what I mean? Yeah, so, that's right. And that's one of the only places in the world I've ever seen it that, you know, everyone's honestly wants you to be your best so that you all have the best chance of survival. Mm. You know, in the private sector, in the, the normal world, everyone will them hold a couple of facts back just to see, you know what I mean? Like they don't quite give you everything that you need to be wildly successful Yep. because that impacts their chances of being wildly successful. Whereas when you're playing for keeps everyone being the best that they can be is literally your goal. Mm. So if someone's doing that, people typically, it's like someone is fumbling with their mags or something. That's one of those situations where you just go, you know, slow is smooth, smooth is fast, Mm. speed is good, but accuracy is final. Let's throw some ice on that. Do it it your way if you want, but then just spend one cereal doing it like this and see how quick you are. Mm. You know what I mean? And it's one of those things as well. And it's just mentally building that up. Yeah. Yeah. So Yeah. I mean, because no one's sort of, I don't think people can naturally be born with it. Mm. You know, there isn't. I've seen the toughest guys like by, and by tough, I mean like physically fit and strong. I've seen them just break mentally. Yeah. Just snap in half when the world's not going the way they are. And then someone who's a a weedy, skinny little dude go three times as far as anyone because he's just tough. Just in training or out in the field as well when it's live? By the time you're out in the field, everyone's... Switched off. Everyone's at that. Yeah. Yeah, like it's the best way to describe it when you're talking about the training and stuff was you're literally training to go to the Olympics, but you don't know what sport you're going to be in. That's an excellent way of putting it. Yeah, you got to be... You got to have everything, and you got you got to assume that you want to be competitive at everything. So, yeah, the good thing about that theory with it is, it really gets you to look at something that, you know, prior to that you're not encouraged to look at. You get you're told to sort of look at what you do well. You know, what do you what do you do well, and then work at that, and really capitalize mm. on what you do well, as opposed to going, what are you shit at? Mm. What's the hardest thing for you? Work on that. Giving Find you a million tools, like, yeah, you know, just then, work at yeah, just niche work, down. Work, yeah, work at the things that you're not good at, you know, but to do that, you've kind of got to step back and go, so in a really brutal self-assessment, what yeah. What am I not good at? Which is kind of good because it's humbling that's at good, the same though. time. That's good, 100%, like humbling and just, you know, self-reflection, that's huge. Yeah. And, and it's good if you get, you know, some people do do that or, you know, it's good if you're sort of getting forced in a way, if you're gonna be getting pushed into that, being a commando, and what you got to do out in the wherever you're gonna be put in for those high pressure cooker situations, you got to really know what you're good at. Hey, so yeah, well, I mean, but just be comfortable in the fact that you can do what you can do. You know, I mean, you can only really affect what you can, what you can impact. You know, what you've yep. sort of got control over. So. 
you start letting go of those other things and going, how can I maximise my chances of survival with the tools that I've got? Mm. You know what I mean? It's a, yeah, and it's a really cool perspective that, you know, I still really, I always look back to the times of things that, that I had back then and then, you know, like, I guess, I guess, look at the impact yep. that I had, man. It just is, yeah, it, it kind of gives you little, little ways to move forward and they're not always good examples they're examples mm. where something didn't work out or or something of like that but yeah yeah and would they see plenty of people like and what you were saying before where there might be a group of 20 and then you think that that individual is going to be they're going to breeze through yeah but plenty of them just go like they just fall through the cracks because mm. they couldn't mentally or physically just keep up with the pace of what's man they <laughs> there was one guy right he's he came through basic training, infantry training. This guy was an absolute workhorse. You know, he was just literally as hard as a coffin nail, like proper hard. But mm. like say pack marching wasn't really a strong point because it just, it, it hurts. Like that's Pack the, marching. And yeah, carrying a pack and yep. just going for an extended period of time. And then put into that environment as well, he knew that he, his step wasn't maybe as long as other people's. So he would kind of have to shuffle or whatever. Like it seemed like it just impacted him more. You know, some people can't do chin-ups or whatever. He, mm. For him, his weak point was pack marching, but he always felt like he was under the pump because of it. That was my experience with him. But then he ended up going to a different battalion to us and he did selection and he hurt his ankle, did selection, hurt something else. Then I remember like he, we, I was seeing him at the gym on base. I was like, you got it this time, bro. Like you're going to be... Yeah, the end of selection, you're going to be across there with us, you know it, don't you? He's like, yeah, man. And he literally, I had no doubts, none, that he was going to get there. There were two days left. I, I'm like, I saw him and I'm like, hey, so when, when are we cracking beers? What's doing? And he's like, no, nah, man, I didn't. So what? What happened? They were doing burpees, right? So right. what they would do is they'd go, okay, you do burpees. And if your form gets crap, you run and touch that tree and that's your rest. You come back and you keep doing burpees. Mm -hmm. That's all the instruction they got. So they're just doing that. Like it's just a beasting. It's one of those. It, through that process, they had one of the directing staff or DS walking through just saying, understand, you might think it's hard now. This is as easy as your life gets from here. This is literally, you think they're going to pay you a hundred grand a year to have a walk in the park? Are you mm. guys serious? Do you know what you're signing up for? Like you got two days to go and this is the start of awful. You don't know awful yet. Mm. Like they literally just had someone there and he pulled his number off. He stood up, pulled his number off and said, okay, I'm done. Really? And I'm like, why? Yeah, I know. See, that's the same thing I thought. I was just like, what are you, t I've seen him, I saw him work so hard, but that's just that thing. You know what I mean? Mine, my mindset, because I was essentially running from the person I was when I lived on the Central Coast, mm. you know, I, the, how I used to behave embarrasses me now, even when I think about it, you know, like yeah. I don't, yeah, I just, I just don't like it. So I was running from that. So if they were saying something like that to me, I was like, I don't care. I don't care. And t unless I wake up in hospital, I'm not getting off this course. I'm not. There is nothing that you can do to me. Honestly, it's physically nothing you can do to me mm. that will stop me right now. But, I mean, that's, you know, at the end of the day, I guess that's the difference in, you know, yeah. eventually. But you get someone like that overseas and you know they're always going to be there. Someone who doesn't, who can get psyched out by that, it's not going to be much good in a firefight, are they? 100%. And talking about someone being there, so that's what, whether it's if I'm talking to people that have served or if it's, you know, what you see in movies or whatever it may be or what you read, just the brother and sisterhood of being in the army and being in tight battalion groups. Like, what does that mean to have a strong unit when you're either if it's training or if it's when you're in action, when you're... Well, it's, it's the only... To me, that's, that's the most important thing is you've got to trust everyone that's around you. Mm. And, like, the culture in the army, especially in our little part of the special forces, the little pocket, everyone who's got a beret is, you kind of, cause you've had some of the similar experiences, you've already got a connection 
mm. like when we first when we first started speaking like both of us are disabled mm. right so we can we've sort of got a different rapport like if you rock yeah if you rock a different guy in and he's kind of coming in and talking about whatever yeah. it's There's, different disabilities but it's connected on, it's on that a, level yeah it's yeah, the yeah, same yeah. thing yeah not the, same, not the same thing you know what i mean but no like, no 100 yeah. so, i'll get yeah but then we'll be on we're kind of on a level like we're, we're right. talking about nerve stuff yeah and then if he chimes in and sort of says oh yeah i had a sciatic once we just kind of look at each other and roll no, our eyes you just different. go yeah, yeah you didn't you know what i mean and that sort yeah. of thing that's the same bond you know, but the bond then has, it's just got a uniform. Yeah. Way. It's like you don't same. have to say, you're just looking at the person and it's like the bond, it's already existing. You just, yeah. You just know. So, you, yeah. and, and that's the thing, you're kind of building on that, you know, so you've already got, it's like a pre-developed rapport, uh, yeah. but then like there's bits of it, but that like, say I find people going through because of the amount of uncomfortable and stuff, which is the same as, you know, but when you've being disabled when something happens to you the amount of uncomfortable in that that you go through it's the same thing i'd watched so i watched a guy who was almost crying because he's that scared of heights like just horribly petrified of the things but putting himself through the roping training you know we're on the eighth story of the firefighting tower down mm. in sydney and this guy's literally like visibly shaking but going through it you just like that like, while he's not good with heights, I'm fine with him. I'm just mm. running, would, would have just run and jumped. Oh, it's cool. Get me underwater. It's a bit of a scary thing. But, like, he was oh, – but watching that, you kind of, like – Just being comfortable or trying to be comfortable in uncomfortable yeah, situations. Yeah, just go – but he's also going as hard as he can. He's pushing himself. Mm. You know what I mean? So then you, it's, it's inspiring in its way. You know what I mean? But I think – and I think that – that sort of thing, sharing though, already having that pre-shared experience with someone makes it easy. You know, even when we're out, there's still, like anyone who's served in the military, I'm like, you know, that's, it's cool. We've got a connection there, but then there's a difference yeah, it's between having that bond. when someone's like, oh, so you're in Bravo Company, I served in these guys for yeah. that. And you're like, okay, cool, we're on a level. Yeah, the different levels, but, yeah. you know, within the army itself. Yeah. So, deployment. So... Various deployments, yeah, and like leading up to your accident, but before that being deployed, take us through the situations like what it's like when I think of like because from what I've seen in the media, yourself, Afghanistan, and what I hear about the country and the narrative of it, just give the listeners and viewers a bit of a, a view on. Yeah, what you've like, gone through, brother. I think there's bits of it. Like, it's great when you speak to you speak to schools or something like that, and they're like, "Is it like Call of Duty?" And then I remember I remember a kid asked that, and everyone laughed at it. And I was like, "It's actually a pretty good question." And you're like, "It's not really." Like, there's bits of it that might be a tiny little bit out of that fragment of that video game, but not. You know, there's bits of it that are based on reality, but not like that there's a lot more waiting around there's a lot more being patient there's a lot more being ready to do something prepared for it and i mean in that my first deployment was to fiji on operation quick step um frank bainamara who's now in charge of fiji was had just seized all the police weapons off the docks and they were having a coup this is in 2006 yeah right. and yeah and then when that's we first, pretty wild, man, over there. It, well, uh, yeah, that's what you sort of think, isn't it? You, we sort of had that. And this was my first deployment, deployment. You know, you'd been in a company, you'd been doing a bit of stuff, and then they've... Um, and what did you feel like? Like, you're in the plane, you're cruising over. No, see, that was the thing. We had to fly up to Townsville. We, when we got briefed, when we are in the, the building at work, they've gone, all right, so... This is, this is what's happening. We got an intelligence brief. They go, all right, so there's three platoons to the company. Alpha and Bravo, uh, one and two platoons, sorry. We're going to, they're going to be on the ground. We're sending them straight in, um, or not straight in, they're going to be on a boat that's sort of postured in a battle box just off the coast, and they're going to be ready to do a parallel follow or, or just be inserted by chopper. The third platoon is going to be based in Townsville. And we're going to, we'll fly, probably jump into water, then swim in. That would be what we do if we're needed. 
So essentially we got told we're just going to be hanging out in Townsville, ready to go the whole time. So you can't, it's not like you can be out on the piss or any junk like that. But yeah, yeah. So I thought, okay, cool. We're, and, you know, and it's a pretty quick situation, you know. They're like, we're doing it all today. Like, okay, cool. Let's in and out situation. Let's go. Yeah, really quick. So Jesus, but not not for us getting out. Just that's when we're going. Right. And then okay. Kind of like we just phone off. We don't know when I'm coming back. And then so we went up. But the minute that we get off the plane in Townsville, we're there and like I'm like, oh, cool. You know, I didn't take a magazine. I didn't take a book. I didn't take an iPod. I took nothing that was of any use except for army gear because I thought that's what we're doing. Just army stuff. And then when we landed, the boss just goes, all right, the plans change, boys. Uh, we're getting on the boat now. And I was like, what? Okay. We're boat. Getting, we're, getting on, we're getting on the boat. The boat was the Canimbla. People in the Navy will ensure that you call it a ship, but it's a fucking boat. It was the worst. Like, what, honestly. Is it, what is it, a blow-up dinghy or what? <laughs> <laughs> now, Canimbla was, I actually wanted to go and see. It got sunk off a Voca. I hated that boat. Oh, they bought it, in the, yeah, they bought it yeah. in the 1930s and we just, they had it loaded literally to the brim with people. They had a whole company of commandos, a squadron of SAS, um, a bunch of Navy and intelligence attachments, choppers the, the just works. squeezed in yeah and it was horrible man like with something the size of this living room we had jesus there was probably 95 of us sleeping four bunks high it was all you could do are you serious in yeah, a space like it was horrible man jesus. imagine imagine going to the gym with two dudes and just being in between them just back to back the whole time just just Sweat and breathing smelling, on each other. Smelling man. Yeah, it was, it wasn't comfortable. But like through that process, the hard thing, it's kind of Groundhog Day for us because you just got to be ready. You know, you got to be ready to go. And then we'd only been out there for a week or two. And the prime minister was at a footy game with the guy who was staging the coup and they were having beers together. Yeah. Okay. So that, what just happened then was exactly what. Like the same thing. You just go, right. what? And the intelligence guy's basically walking in going, so we're out here now. Um, you know, they've got this and you get a brief every day. You get a brief at the same time and it just, you knew that you were going nowhere. You were just in a battle box just going around. Yeah. And like that trip got interesting. I saw a guy with long hair that I knew. And I was like, okay, he's obviously from one squadron. And I'm like, mate. And they're cool with that stuff. Like once you're out and qualified to some degree, like, because you see, like, if it's in America, like it's short buzz cuts, like, you know, with the hair and yeah, you got Sean shaving and all that stuff. You got like, a bit more freedom. When okay. Because there's specific things. With the job that you do, you do so many shit things that for someone to go, look, man, you're not shaving or your hair's getting a little long, you're like, man... I've been out field for a month and the last thing I was thinking of when I got back was shaving so that I impress you. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's one, of the, it's one of the things that I think, one of the freedoms you get. But this guy had it and I remembered him. I'm like, I, do you play baseball, bro? And he's like, I used to play first grade cricket for Tukli. I remember you playing when you had lo your long blonde hair. <gasps> Are you serious? Like, yeah, and I was like... Yeah, right. I remember he used to sit there and you, he used to wear like flip-flop things and he would sit and like read a paper. He had his little thing at Tookley. And, um, that would have spun you out. It did. It was wild. But it, this gets, it gets really real because we were up on this, like they had a smoking deck, which at the time I still, you know, you'd still have a, sm a cigarette occasionally and everyone would do it. It was kind of like the, the little party spot. So you right, get a ton yeah. of people out there. Everyone's hanging out. People are telling jokes. And, you know, if, if like, one of the Navy Just chicks or whatever works out, all of a sudden everyone's, like, being twice as funny and stuff. Yeah. And then we hear – they were doing a chopper training drill. Well, they would do a sniper drill where one would back up, one would land. Okay. And then it would pick up and then they'd swap it around. This was happening for a while before it – and we just heard this bang. <laughs> And you like you look up, and there were rotor blades flying in the air, and then like you're just like fuck. And one of the guys who was our CSM at the time just yelled, "Take cover!" It was like something out of a movie. And then you get down, 
And I was sort of near these stairs that went up to the comms deck. He ran past me. I chased him up the stairs and I was like, okay, cool. And he goes, one. And I thought, what the fuck is he doing? So I just put one finger up behind me and I go and look over the rail. He was counting people up from the water and he goes, two. We got to six on our side of the boat. And I was just like six. What, from the bloody helicopter? Yeah, so the chopper hit the back of the ship, rolled a couple of times and then into the water. And it, man, by the time we were, it was all, that happened pretty quick. Like we were up there pretty quick, but there was no bubbles. You couldn't see where it had gone down, but you could see people popping up from it. And then. Bu- this, popping up <laughs> alive had, or what? Yeah, well, so we had six on our side and two came up. They were so deep when they got out of the chopper that they came up on the other side of the ship. So they've got rebreathers that they work with the choppers, but yeah, they're yeah, yeah, doing yeah. a drill, and that was the thing. They're like, so, and I was like, well, there had to be more people on that chopper, but we've only got eight up. They shut comms down, they shut everything down, and um, like they go until the families have been notified, and there's a process they've got to go through and stuff like that. So we couldn't, you couldn't call home, you couldn't do anything. You couldn't use any of the any of the phones, any of the sat phones, any of that sort of stuff. Yeah, is that just because they think like some people might just leak it and then it's just going to spread? And yeah. then yeah, I mean the last way that you want to find out that your relative yeah. is, is from your neighbour or something. Yeah, yeah, he's on the he's on the news. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's so that true. Was the, there's a lot of that. Like they call it operational security or opsec, and like, but I remember they didn't brief us on who it was. It's not like they're going to put a slideshow together, mm. and they go look. They're going to They've, they've told the families they've been notified because of the timing. It's going to be on the news tonight. And I remember we were all down in the lower deck, like in the spot where we had to sort of, like we were sleeping in that little tight section. And I remember like just going, no, 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 I can't. I had this really weird feeling. And then they go, you know, Trooper Josh Porter has been killed in the chopper crash, blah, blah, blah. And the pilot, Mark Bingley, and it was fucking Josh. I looked at it and just... Yeah. Like... That's heavy. Really? And it got, like, at that stage, it got very, very real. Like, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, like, being in the army and what happens and, and the reality of Yeah, of that. Death. And it's, but yeah, and especially, but, like, of all the people, it wasn't just someone else who joined the army. It was a guy who I'd play cricket against you know I sort of yeah that was like and but just what what are the chances of that like literally I mm. I, I all I'm always thinking about like the probability and basic statistics what is the likelihood of I that know. happening it just blew that was just blowing my mind you know like that we both joined the army that he was in the SAS I was in the I was I was a commando and this is like oh it would have been 11 years after we played cricket against each other, you know, like, and then mm. to both be on the same trip to Fiji doing the same thing. And then that happened, like after we'd said, yeah, but it was, it was, it was really mind blowing. Like, and, and what did that do to you? Like as, like as a soldier, as a commando and just, yes, it's a, is a realization of death is real and it's involved, but how do I, deal with this and move forward and operate as best as I can be. We just do it. Mm. We just do it. Like, I chose, like, that was, it was sort of then that you realise, like, I have, like, and I don't like the word sacrifice with military service. It's a choice. You know, that's how I felt it worked better with me if I kind of owned the whole thing. Like, this is my choice. This is what I'm doing. This is what I've chosen. This is what I've chosen to do. Bits of it go with it. And I'm kind of glad they do. I hope that they're up to the task because I think I am. You know, that was the sort of mindset I tried to put myself through. And, um, and yeah, it ended up, like, we ended up on that boat for, like, God, it was only, like, eight weeks. It was a long, it felt like a long time, a yeah. really long time. When you're on something that's the size of those boats, there isn't that much stuff that you can do. And where were, like, so... Just off the co- we were off the coast of Fiji. I literally had never stepped... One on foot to the island um, itself. Never, I'd never had. I mean, I've done two speaking jobs there now. Yeah, and both of them I've started with. Like, geez, it's really nice to actually get on the ground in Fiji. Yeah, you know, like, um, but, but yeah, but where was it? Like weeks was right. You got eight weeks, but so when 
the crash happened, where was that? Like week six or week oh, I think midway week through? Or four or five. So then you're still something. sitting on the boat. Yeah. You've got no, and then you're just sitting there constantly. Yeah. I don't I, know if I it's thinking sleep. about it or. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't sleep. I was really struggling with it. Like I hated it. Just the fact that you can't and you can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. Mm. They're not. They're not going home, and you know the coup's not going to happen. Like I remember, we well after we'd been to East Timor, right? We had General General Mike Hindmarsh. He was the special operations commander at the time, and mm. every now and then you get a dignitary like that or something that flies back with you, or that's over there at the same time, and you get to meet them or whatever, and you sit down and people do whatever they want for their careers to go forward. And <laughs> he come and sat next to me when we flew back from Timor, which I deployed to at the end of 2007. Yeah. And he goes, oh, hey, so how you going? I'm, I'm like, hey, how you doing, sir? You all right, mate? And he's like, yeah, so, you know, how are you finding it? I'm like, why did you, why, Fiji, why? Mm. What are you doing? Like literally three, three days into it, the guys are drinking beers. I yeah. like, had that moment where I was still holding a grudge. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. he's just like, oh, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to deploy you guys than it is get you back. We needed you there at the time to do this and then there's achievements, objectives and blah, blah, blah. It's just like a political chessboard. It's yeah. just the pawns are getting pushed out. Yeah, and that was my first yeah. experience in having it really go the other way. You know what I mean? In being yeah. in the receiving end of it. Like looking, but looking back, I think I was a bit too anxious for something to have to happen. You know, I'd always battled ADD when I was young, but mm. then when you're stuck, the walls get, sort of smaller where i think it, whereas if i was there now doing it now i'd have a different perspective on it you know i was still kind of young mm. so i just dip my head in being on there you know there's surely there's important things that we could be doing we could be training getting ready we could you know and then i had um doing something to clear that space for you mentally and physically yeah that, yeah like let's get ready for when something mm. really kicks off aren't we wasting time here type thing and then um but it wasn't until i was getting ready to deploy in 2007 I'd, um, I remember getting the call We were doing a boat exercise Like in the rigid hull Inflatable boats The ribs Right And I got this call saying Hey You're, um, you're going to Timor I'm Like oh um, cool Cool When? He's like Friday I'm like It's it's Wednesday And He's like Yeah you should pack And where were you? Were you down in we were in New the South Paramount Wales? River. Yeah <laughs> Like we were doing a, a thing A thing out there And I was like Right yeah, okay, sweet. I'll just let, I'll let him know. He goes, yeah, it's probably best that you get back here. And I'm like, cool. And that was the first time just before that trip I'd had, um, I, like my relationship had broken down. Things weren't, weren't going great, but that, so that was kind of my way. A lot of relationship, you had a partner at yeah, the time and it wasn't working out. It wasn't working. I don't okay. think it was, like it's a very unique sort of partnership that makes a career in the army work mm. you know i still don't know how people do it and functionally do it like it's just it amazes me um how people can be that 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 devoted to everything that's that's happening it just add, it adds a real complication to it yeah. like you can literally be a hundred percent sure that none of the couples i've married at first sight at last and um 100 we <laughs> my missus loves that show um uh, but yeah, oh man yeah this, uh, yeah i could i could it could turn into a it could turn into a bryce bashing couldn't it <laughs> um but yeah no we uh and when when i deployed every the time was sort of right with that deployment for everything to fall into place career-wise i had like a team our team of six had five guys that i really looked up to that were really just open, really amazing guys who really want it. Like, so were you like the younger fella, like in the ranks there at the time, or? Yeah, I'd spent the least time in the army, right. but there was guys who were younger than me or whatever. But you, like, you kind of just wanted to get they'd give you little nuggets that could make you better the whole time, you know? Because they wanted they they wanted our team to present the best. That's it. Around the guys that are around us and stuff, and it was a really cool environment for, you know, like just just to be in and understand what was going to be involved in, in serving and be really ready to make that sacrifice. And I found there was one guy I gelled really well with there. You know, we were, we'd run and train together and stuff like that. And it was, he was really cool, man. Like he just, it's fun to have someone like that that you get along with so well. And and you got the fun part. What's the, and competitive? Yeah, man, you always want to run quicker. And he mm. was always that bit quicker. 
He was that bit quicker. He was a bit stronger. He could do like one more of everything. So he's the best person to chase. We're doing handstand push-ups by the end of it. It was great fun. But table tennis, it was always a good match. When we were back at the A pod, and I was playing table tennis against him. Yeah, that was one scalp thing. On. <laughs> yeah, that my my I had a hand, <laughs> but his was his was good. You know, but so it was like it was kind of one of those things, and we were super competitive, like doing the Leighton thing to each other. It was good fun. Come like, on. Yeah, come on. Yeah. And he, but he gave me this one moment that made me, that I really needed to have. You know, sometimes, you know, I guess I was, I was probably a bit ahead of myself for the first part mm. of being a commando. And then we, he was, he was a bit down one day and he was pretty stoked, dude. And I was like, mate, what's up? Right. And he's like, it's my son's birthday today. And I'm like, shit, dude, how old is he? He's like four. Like it's a, that's a good age. Like a, you know, that's hard though, yeah. not being there for your youngsters' birthday. So, yeah, so that's sort of what I was saying to him as well. And he goes, "You don't get it, man." And I'm like, "I know, I don't have kids." And he goes, "I haven't seen one of them yet." And I was like, "Wow!" wow. And then he went through what he was doing. Each time it was his boy's birthday, and I was just like, "Was it because of circumstance with like?" The nature of the job? Yeah, or? Just, just timing. Like, you, they work, like, you know, even, even friends I've got that are still in, they just work like absolutely nothing else. You know, I mean, and it's not a matter of having hours a week that you have to work. It's objectives that you've got to achieve. Yep. It's things that have to, uh, like, capability-based assessment style thing. You know, there's no real time to rest in that. You're always posturing. You're always doing something. There's always an exercise and... And you what's the average timeline? Like if you're looking at deployment, like it could be... Oh, it depends. Like Timor was three months. You know, we had... Yeah, it's a quarter of a year. Yeah. I mean, it's a long time. I mean, it was good. But we got back just in time for... Like we got to back just before Christmas and whatever it was. Mm. Which is kind of good. Like you get back and you're, you know, really happy to see everyone. It's the summer break. And, you know, I got just enough time a couple of weeks off after it that we could really knuckle mm. in and because at that stage yeah. Afghanistan rotations were already sorted out we knew with the company that we're in that we were deploying to Afghanistan in pretty much like 12 months or 14 months it worked out at. so when we got there we effectively had our build yeah. refit stage build up stage get used to your team and that for that entire time and pull the ins and outs of all the exercises that we'll have to do and then we're we're going out we're going to Afghanistan mm. So was there much build up in Timor, like, like with what was going on there? Because they had, you know, grill armies and stuff going. Yeah, it was pretty sweet when we were there. Man. Yeah, like, okay. I don't think, I don't think, I mean, I can't obviously speak for every deployment, but mm. ours was, ours was more just making sure there was still stability there. You know, the the country as in itself is still reasonably young. Mm. You know, where it's come from, when it sort of gained its independence. Yeah. You know, so we're we're generally there to support that. Um, yeah. That deployment was off the back of rice riots Yeah, back yeah. in the day where like rice had been seized to try and overthrow the government and we kind of stepped in, I think, and sort of said, that's not mm. the way that you rule a country, kids, let's type thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's... Because I always think of like when I was when I was in rehab over a decade ago, like spinal rehab, and I was told by some of the people that were working there that they flew in a father and son from Timor that had been chopped up by machetes from some of the the mob over there. That, yeah, the, the opposing the mob. Indos, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they just they were just in in pieces or had pieces missing from them. Yeah. I mean when they in- sh- and they were both quadriplegics. Yeah. Father, right. Yeah, father and son. That's from hectic. Timor. Yeah, pretty heavy. Yeah, so I think that that sort of timing of that was more in the first wave of this yeah, sort of thing. the first group. yeah so originally there was the the east timor indonesian from what i understand they had there was where they were getting their independence they needed assistance and that's when timor one happened mm. then it was the peacekeeping force which was around 98 ish i think that sort of had that that phase of things and then in 2006 they had the rice riots and we sent guys straight over to that and i'm not it could have been could have been then there was militia mm. but as soon as we turn up told to the ears yeah, most so of that sort of stops you know what I mean? like, yeah 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 so it was just jumped on it and sorted it out yeah, and then it was um, just trying to keep 
the pace. Yeah, keep the pace. Essentially, mm. we'd go out and see what people were thinking about. You know, you'd spend four days out and then four days in from this airport. Like, it was still, it was, man, it's absolutely gorgeous. Flying into Dili, it's a, tr- mm. it's a tropical island. There's these beautiful reefs out there. Like, it just was, man, some of the coolest memories that I've got, like getting chopped around places and just, like, you're just doing everything to make sure your body's in the right spot. You can mm. get fit. You can do all those things. It was... It was really cool without that much threat that you're going to get sort of shot. You're not really worried about yeah, anything yeah. sort of going too wrong. So it was it was great, man. And, yeah, I think that one re- is really really where I found my feet in the, in the work world that we're in. Okay. You know, I understood. I found my spot. Plus I kind of, you know, I grew up surfing on yeah. the Central Coast. Yeah. You know, I kind of, that was what I knew mm. and things like that. So, I, you yeah. know, whereas when I... When I joined, I was like, "We've got. To, I've got to be a commando. I don't. A yeah. Commando's just a title. I've just got to be me, you know. Which is pretty casual, pretty laid back, very intense at odd times. But you know what I mean, like. Yeah. So I, I think on that trip, I got confident enough to just be myself and find my identity, which was a bit. Yeah. A bit of fun. That's awesome, and going to, you know, what you're finding, just tapping back into your mate and to do with his youngster and the. And birthdays, not seeing them. So what was that that you found? Yeah, well, you're just like, uh, it's really giving you the right to feel things. Mm. You know, you don't have to be a cold-blooded mess. You know what I mean? To, yeah, to, to do be it, to deployed do a into like, it. Yeah, into a To be a commando like, yeah. or SAS or whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't make you, and that doesn't really make you an effective troop. You, you do have to have, I guess, a, a switch to an extent, but you still got to, Mm. be rational enough and i found that 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 kind of was a bit it was good on that trip to be able to sort of reel everything back in and just be me and then it left me in good stead with the company that i was i was in you know to be able to go and get ready to to do our job in afghanistan so same company going from team or bang and then you start to no, fl- I, when we first moved back our team got put in different spots okay so i ended up going across the bravo company which was well, yeah, one of the one of the companies at work, one of the four commando companies. Yeah, right. So, what was it like flying into Afghanistan and just the feeling of it? Just probably because you already know what's been going on in the yeah. country for a few years. So, I mean, it, it's surreal. Like, but there's we were there, and it was a really interesting time because reputations at work at a normal unit, essentially, from what I understand, because I never really spent time at one. It used to be, have you got time up? like how much time you got up type thing. Whereas at ours, you could have a private who's already deployed twice. You know, how much time you got up? More in Afghanistan than you. So just shh, type mm. thing. You know what I mean? There was yep. this real sort of thing. And that was, that was where there was reputations of guys who, that were just, you know, you're like... Was that just wow. within the Australian Army or was it a that mix? That was just, or? Yeah, yeah, just our, just our unit. And so yeah, you, right. by the time you were getting there, you're like, okay, so we're... Now we're about to hit the ground. This is real. All right, it's go time. And now it's... Like, to me, it's sort of... Sort of rep- I, I liked it just because it's the ultimate test, isn't it? You know what I mean? Like, mm. I've got... You've got everything of all the places that I haven't been proud of being in my entire life i'm doing something that i'm proud of with people that i'm just over the moon that i get to work with you know to go over and really stretch it you know i mean there aren't many places that you can go i'm literally going to have be guaranteed to have my life on the line here mm. you know like it's not imagining what a firefight's going to be like or what i'm going to be like in one or any of these no, different things it's, it's real it's yeah happening. this is real and like there was this little sense of yeah, how's that feel? Yeah, it's little. It's like it was to me. It was like it's exciting. You know, it's exciting, and it's just one of those. Okay, here it is. It's this is this is showtime, and this is the the biggest show that you're gonna get. Let's. It was. I don't know. I like stuff that challenges me. Mm. So that to me was. It was pretty much the test, wasn't it? So. Major test. Yeah, and that's the that's the one. I mean, it's you got you, in the army. I got to do so many things that like made it so rewarding you know i hadn't traveled that much you know and by the time i'd been in for i think like two years i'd trained in every state in australia you know i mean i'd I'd 
been off the coast of Fiji. We'd done all sorts of stuff. Yeah, we jumped yeah. out of planes. We parachuted. We'd done all of these different things yeah. in buildings that you normally couldn't get to, behind all these things that needed an ID to get into, to all of these different things that were just yeah, so... high security systems and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, all of that type of stuff that just was... You'd never, literally never get the chance to be involved in it. Like now yeah. I look at... You remember they were doing that the thing on the harbour the other day and the chopper rotors hit the 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 ferry? Oh right. Or whatever yeah, it was yeah, or the yeah. boat. That's like it's kind of cool, but yeah. to look at that and go, Yeah, imagine what we'd be saying at work about that. Like being on the chopper and then yeah, waiting yeah, yeah. or hearing it's happened or something like that. Like it's such a foreign world to people, but you're the guy who's in there. Yeah, you true. Know, the being the guy under the mask was a pretty good good feeling, you know. And I guess that was sort of part of the joy you know you'd, I'd, you'd watch war documentaries i'd looked at the pictures of my granddad and mm. gone you know i wonder what it's like i wonder what it's like and now this is what it's like okay it's like kind of like if you know how you always drive past some streets yeah, and then yeah. one day randomly you'll drive out it and you'll just be like oh this is the intersection that i always yeah that's yeah. what this feels like and is that what it felt like as soon as you started going out of the gates of the compound ready for like what what would you guys call it, like, if it be a mission or going out for, like... Operation. It's an operation? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think. You're like, you'd have... We were task, task Force 66 was our, our whole group, and we... It was, sort of, it was sort of one of those things. You go, okay, cool, we're going... I think it was an operation. Yeah, because everything else has got exercise. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Exercise whatever but when it's major and whatever it's, it's operation blah, yeah blah, blah, blah and yeah you get your group of orders you get what you were doing and like when i got hit we were we were spending three weeks in the cars out going over into a place called helmand province which is just the wild west doing like recon stuff or no we were going to for it there was a specific task like the way that i think it works i don't know i've never been in one of the leadership rooms but there's a huge sort of map where all of the different forces, like the US, the Canadians were in the same spot, the Dutch sort of shared a base with us. Like all of you work to achieve different objectives when you're on the ground. So we were the moving force that were going through to do specific tasks that we were given, but that would then work in with what this group over here are doing. You know what I mean? Like yeah, we're gonna okay. move through, then they're gonna check radio signals of where are they going to. You know, like, because we always had, we had technological dominance, we had weapon dominance, we could fight at night, we can do all of these things. We had all the odds stacked in our favour, so we're, while using all of them. Because that's what I always read. Around and stuff. Yeah, okay. Because that's what I always, like, hear or read or see that, you know, the Australian army as a whole and what it can produce is, like, you know, it's top tier. Yeah. Yeah. Like like when when you're, it, yeah, when you're looking at other, like, nations across the world. Yeah, some of them. I mean, you look at the high-end US Special Forces. They came out and trained with us after I was hit, like, and some of the shit they brought. They had, like, fusion night vision, which is probably a thing now. I don't know. I've been out for too long, and I never really spend too much time thinking about it, but, like, mm. literally night vision where it was night vision through, I think it was, you had the four-goggle night vision, but it turns into, like, uh what's the heat oh like a thermal. heat scent yeah, yeah that's the thermal. one yeah thermal imagery yeah yeah like, like, so that, like the predator yeah, 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 you, yeah, can yeah. Have, <laughs> you can have sort of both of them yeah. and like all of a sudden your vision's almost the full 180 that you can get but you can do thermal you can do night you, jeez like some of the toys that they brought over whew, it's mind-blowing and i mean when you think we were we were still light years ahead of the the guys that we were fighting you know, I mean, but on the same hand, it's not, it wasn't conventional. It wasn't like you're organizing in a field to fight. Mm. You know what I mean? You're not, it's not a boxing match where you know where it's going to be and where it's going to happen. It was like a guerrilla war, you know, so that, but then there'd be places that they say we would get intel that they would go to, depending on what they were doing. And this guy we know is a target. All the targets were given different names. Mm -hmm. So they're like, God, rapier or whatever. They were all, all pretty cool names. Whoever was naming them, like, they they had a good time um <laughs> but yeah so and you do different jobs on like you'd you get in that something was near us where we were driving the vehicles and then you know you'd formulate a plan to be able to do a vehicle drop off a, v, a video and then walk into target and then do the job that you were doing yeah and like our platoon, and how were the locals like what was the reception from like when you're cruising around the town if you did see anyone they kind of steered 
pretty clear. It was like you know that it's getting pretty real when we were driving towards one after we'd been through like the Chora Valley and all the women and children in this big drove of probably like 50, 100 people were walking out of the village. They were all together and they were all just getting out. And you like, know that it's on its way on? here. You're like, okay, the women and children are leaving. It's you can just feel like you're yeah. seeing it, but you can feel it too. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're just sitting in this. Oh, okay, all right, here it is. You know, you kind of just accept that, and you just get hit at different stages during the night. They'll just let you know they're there. Um, fire some shots at you and whatever. Just boop, boop, oh, okay. Type thing. It's it. Yeah, really weird sort of feelings mm. i mean the first the first contact that we have man you gotta you laugh at this we 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 just we'd driven for like two days you know we'd had a, a little bit of rest but you're just exhausted right you're just and then so we're doing this thing and i drew the good number to have the first picket so i was like i'm gonna get to sleep for like four hours after this this is awesome i went i sat down i'm wearing like these cut off pants that were into shorts and my armor with mm. a sh- with a like yeah singlet underneath it right, just right. like sitting there in my helmet going okay cool so all I gotta do is just sit here sweet all right you worked out what's there there's your picket list there's radio oh, cool okay here it is and I looked down but it was far enough away for me not to really worry too much about it and this little cloud puffs up around it I'm like okay. And then I hear this. I was like, Close. But. Oi. And like, so I called the team commander over. It was pretty close to us at the time. Were you in a convoy or just on your no, own? No, we'd, we'd already stopped. So we'd formed a big harbor. So everyone's in a really solid defensive position. But still, there's not much you can do if you're getting mortared. Right. And um, so I said, <laughs> are our mortars, please tell me that our mortars are, f- are like doing a test fire. And he's like, why? And I'm like, that. And we look and there's just this cloud of dirt. And he's like, Bruh! So I had to, we had to run back over, gear up, get everything ready for our next group of orders from it. And then, yeah. So that was the first sort of thing I was in. And I remember waking like this, the kid up who was the gunner on my car. And I'm like, all right, don't freak out, man. We're fucking getting mortared. And he's literally like, I just saw the white in his eyes. Like, that's all I could see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Off we go. And then, yeah, it was, it kind of went from there. It ended up one of those sort of things. But we were so, and three weeks further down the track of stuff like that happening, we got the word Mm. that I was doing, um, like, we're basically support vehicles. Where the support vehicles for the other platoon who... Man, Cam Baird was in that platoon. He was a legend, that dude. Yeah, okay. Um, he, they, so they were walking on the target doing the job and then we, we were going up supporting snipers. And yeah, I was the fifth car in line and my car just hit, hit an IED, which is really weird because we were driving in each other's wheel tracks. And you're talking about your, this is your car, yeah, car yeah? The one that you're in, yeah? Yeah, so a special reconnaissance vehicle. Dude, it was next to me. He grew up yeah. in Berkeley Vale. Crazy, right? No more. Yeah, and he's a year younger than me. Mind blown. But he was always my senior. Mm. Odd. But um, yeah, and then the kid in the back, and then and explain to the listeners and viewers what are IEDs? Improvised explosive device. That's so right. we don't really, we don't know. We think that mine was an old anti tank mine. We're not sure. You know, we've got because there's different things that you can do with explosives, which give the ch- the force direction. Right. Um, and ours seem pretty centralised, which is the same way that... Yeah. Oh, the trajectory. Yeah. Of a, yeah. You take okay. out the, tra- the track of a tank or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, because I got, I got hammered. I lost like, my right leg. So, this is the one that led to the, uh, to what blew yeah, and my led right to leg off. Amp- my, left, my left leg was crushed and the x-ray is actually amazing. It ripped a heap of skin off it and stuff. But the bones were sort of shattered. It was a it was a shit fight. It was like it Jesus curled my toes Christ. and cramped the whole way up. My right elbow, my right arm was dislocated. The elbow was hanging out a hole somewhere near the back. Both bones in the arm, three in the hand. 
Um, that thumb, this, this thumb just always gets broken. Like literally, no matter what happens, if something's going to get broken, it's that thumb. Yeah, okay. It's like three times. It's got three pins or four pins in it at the moment. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then that arm got done and a couple of scratches and stuff like that. So, but I don't, I don't remember that. I, don't, I remember waking up, like not waking up, but I remember flashes of being in hospital and stuff. And so like, that's where you woke up in hospital, uh, yeah, hospital back in base, Germany. Germany. Yeah, man. So we, the way that it worked was we'd fly to a UK thing called Bastion and like the guys kept me alive for 56 minutes and then, yeah, I woke up in Germany, I think. That was the first I can sort of remember. It's pretty hectic. So what was that whole, so how long did it take to get you from Afghanistan to? To Germany. Uh, they had to stabilise me for two days. Right. And you're totally out. Gone. Gone. Yeah. So apparently, because oh, oh, I can't remember any of it, I thought that I would have just mm. been knocked out or just laid there and happily taken it like a champ. But yeah. apparently I was screaming or something like that. Apparently I was making a bit of racket. It yeah, was, okay. Yeah, it was pretty messy. But like it's all, it's pitch well, black. That's pretty well. reasonable to t- make a bit of racket when you've had that much damage. <laughs> Mate, yeah, one of the boys turns, he was, he had, was looking out like sort of from it you've got to do you all around security is such an important thing especially because mm. we can hear what they say because it's not the fucking 20s yeah yeah and um they were sort of saying they were getting a group of people ready to come and like in, basically engage where the white light was which was what they had on me trying to keep me alive so people were moving into spots and turns said he was looking out and he just all he heard was me just make this horrific screech like proper screechy scream and he was like man the, he's he's dying man and it just he said he hated it like it was the worst thing the amount of nights that he'd woken up hearing that was just horrible it's just echoed through his head yeah, yeah but then after it he said it was followed by the funniest thing that i've heard in a war zone and i'm like what could that be the kid Funny. who was the gunner yeah the kid okay. who was the gunner had <laughs> to put a tourniquet around my leg, because it's yep. gone so far up, he got my nuts caught in the tourniquet. <sighs> so that was me screeching because he's tourniqueting oh, my nuts he, to my leg. He's dragging them. Yeah. And cutting so that, off the blood flow. That's it. So what I'm are you doing? <laughs> and then you just hear this voice just go, he's still got his nuts. Yeah. Like do that. and that kind I can of, understand where the screech is coming from now. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So that was, I mean, that was one of the first questions I think I asked. You know, I mean. And so, yeah, and like tourniquet, like what was, so the sequence is bang, tourniquet on, the rest of the boys are around, what, you know. It was pretty and, complex. Like you got to try and stop, like it's, it's stop the bleeding, get fluid in. You don't want the fluid to be too wet or it'll cause me to go into shock. Right. I've obviously lost a heap of fluid, plus I'm bleeding from a stack of different places. You got to do what you can. You can't have too much morphine. But then you got blood going through, so you kind of want me to be calm enough. But Apparently, did they have that all sort of on deck, like with some of the medics there, yeah, or what? We they all had, we all had we'd all carry tourniquets, tourniquets, bags of bags of fluid. Bleeding. Yeah, okay. It, like every team's got two medics in it. If yep. you're in a special forces team, you're either a, a demolitions, communications, or medical specialist. Like mm-hmm. you've got a specialist skill. Mm-hmm. So that's we the kid who was in the back of my car was one of the medics. So. You know, he did uh, he did parts of the work. Turns did a heap of the stuff as well. You know, I mean, you got like all that time of doing what you can to essentially keep me alive. I was yeah. wearing like the, we used to call them puff daddies, those, like the jackets, the puff jackets. Yeah, 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 yeah. We had yeah, like yeah. green ones of them on and you can't cut them properly with the trauma shears. Ah, uh, okay. So he's like getting his Spyderco knife out, trying to like cut these things off me. And I was uh. trying to. The guy who was next to me told me a story. Like, and I, it was weird because I didn't want to tell. Hardcore him. situation, man. Yeah, man. And I, I, but I didn't want to, like, then ask everyone, just go, oh, boys, so what was it like? Mm. Like, what was one of the most horrific nights you're going to have? Like, what was it like? Like, mm. that's a bit selfish, I thought. Yeah. But then when I chatted to one of the boys, he, I was like, man. It's hard. Like, it's, you know, it's super tough for yourself, like, going through that, but also the ripple effect yeah. that it's having on everybody else that was there that either saw it or helping you to stay alive essentially yeah 100 yeah, man 100 and you're always worried you're like what do they are they cool with that you know like what do they think what's going through their mind with it so you want to protect them from having to think about it you know what i mean so but it turns out that say turns ago i was talking about mm. yeah he took he uh, killed himself um 
sort of three three years ago. He had a he had a tough run of it before it, but I remember we'd sit down and we got really close before before he took his life. And um, oh, the bit of the, yeah, the black dog come, eh? A bit, yeah. I mean, he yeah, he was all there was a like a lot That's of different hard, factors that went into it. But I remember talking to him and him just going like he, he told me the whole thing through his and he's like, I was waiting for you to come to me. I was like, man, I was waiting for you to come to me. So we're literally both wanting to have the same conversation that it took us like eight years to have for eight years. We're just sitting there like looking at each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like waiting for someone to be comfortable with it. But yeah, it was interesting when I was on the ground, but apparently I was trying to run away. I was trying, and I had with no legs that apparently looked interesting, but yeah. I was trying to sort of, so I'm kicking while they're trying to do stuff. And I had my, Jesus. the guy was next to us. He had me in mount effectively. Like he was sort of sitting on my, on my gut pushing down on my shoulders and over his arms, I was throwing punches at him with broken arms and hands and stuff that all he could hear was bones grinding as it just was pushing in his face, trying to get him off me. Right. So like that was essentially, yeah, I guess. Cause he's saying. just trying to control you so you can, you know, keep you alive. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially like that. And like, but just to give you, to give you an idea, like later on down the track, I was, you know, I did a Mel Gibson movie called Hacksaw Ridge. And my character gets blown up and like ripped apart in it. And you see a guy on the ground with two legs missing and screaming and doing that thing. And I warned all the boys before they watched it. I was like, guys, this, I'd get blown up again. I've got a really shit average. Like realistically, if that counted as a deployment, that's, that's 50% of deployments I've been on, I've got blown up on. And um, yeah, so I said, you know, and I asked them after it, I'm like, did it look real? Like, mm. cause you know, that's all you're trying to do if you act, you know, mm. Mm. did it, was it believable? And they're like, so, sort of, I'm like, what do you mean sort of? And they go, it looked way worse, man. Like, and when you look at the scene in Hacksaw Ridge, it's horrific. Like mm. it's, and then kind of puts it into perspective. Yeah, I remember like, it. It's a pretty yeah. full on movie. Yeah, it is. It's pretty, <laughs> like, do you know, what? I asked mum about it. I was like, mum, so what do you think? She, was it believable? She goes, not really. I said, why? What? She goes, you guys, you know, you had an American accent. This is because my guy's American, mum. Is that because God. she just knows you, yeah, so I, it's hard for her to believe? Or? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. I don't know. She's just like, you know, he's got an American accent, you know, and you don't have kids. I'm like, mum, it's what actors do. They pretend. <laughs> like, they <laughs> Professional yeah. pretenders. Yeah, essentially, yeah. essentially, I guess. Like it's, but I, I think it's weird when you start meeting mm. people who speak in a different accent. Like I just did a thing with that Paul Mescal. His name is, mm. and he's Irish, but he's in Carmen, which is the movie that's being cut and edited now. Nice. He, he plays the lead, and what he's Aussie? got no, he's a southerner from the US. Yeah, so right. it's based in in Arizona, so Ma the Mexico Arizona border to try and get over to California. Yeah, right. Thing. So then you know, so he just switches on, switches on being puts it in. Got the southern accent from being full blown Irish to. Yeah. Yeah. I see a letter J. <laughs> kind of does that, and then that was the only thing because I hadn't met him before. Then we go in and we're yeah. doing that sequence, and that's one of the things. Sort of. Yeah. yeah right. So how you doing? You know, I'll, I'll see you later, J. <laughs> And you hear him do that and you're like, oh, okay, cool. And then when we were talking after it, mm. he just flat out Irish. Like he, yeah, <laughs> he's, that spins me out. Man, hey. he's as Irish as St. Paddy's Day. And like it just yes. is, it's, it's one of those things about as well. Like the different guys you've seen and worked with yeah. in different places all, it shows you how good they are. But when you watch them and for the first bit, you're like, oh, that's, such and such, you know, like that's this guy who I worked with there and he's such a fun loving dude, but he's really intense here. Mm. And then a, a scene or two into it, you just literally, he's that character. Just puts it on. Yeah. They're just like, it's so believable, you know, yeah. and that's, it's one of the things that those guys that are great do. Yeah. 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 Mate, we're well, going back to Germany. Yeah. Wake, waking up realization of. You know, the trauma that you've been through, like m mentally and physically major, major surgery, like what's going through your mind when you're 
Well, like when you're looking down and it's snow legs, looking at your arms and everything else that's going on. See, like I think I kind of got, man, I just got the best role with it because I had a closed head injury. You know, I mean, like my brain got rattled. It was like getting hit in the head by Mike Tyson if he was the size of a dinosaur. You know what I mean? Like it was just yeah. So there was there was uh, yeah really bad bruising on my brain from how close I was to the explosion and obviously it hit my face pretty hard. So I couldn't really, and I had pain medications and morphines and all this junk mm. going through me at the time. So I didn't really grasp where I was, but then they would take you off that and you know, you're in immense bits of pain and then other times you're happy and some you're social. And mm. you know, I've always, I've always loved like acting in movies and stuff. Like Stephen Baldwin came in and I loved him in Biodome. I watched mm. that movie a thousand times when I was young. And when he walked in, I was so angry with where I was at the time. Like, and now they send the forgotten Bob and brother. Like, I don't want to fucking talk to you, man. <laughs> like, and he was just coming in, just being cool, you know, just being nice. You know, that was his yeah, Christian right. mission or whatever he was doing at the time. And like, at that stage, but it was about a day after they woke me up after plating that arm for the first time, like beyond that, it was splintered. And that when I did, they have to ease you out of no, what, whatever situation, I, or you just naturally w- wake up out of? No, well, like with that one, I think I was awake before. I can't, I can't remember. Yeah, I just okay, remember this because okay. it was like my dad was looking at me. He was watching when it happened, and my heart heart rate went from like sixty five. Hold on, in Germany, so he in Germany, yeah, so they he, flew my whole family out there. Jesus. Yeah. So right. my mum, my dad, my sister and my brother-in-law came out. And yeah, it was kind of, it was comforting to sort of see them. But yeah, it was, my dad was looking at me through, like in the recovery room. They let him be in there. And he said he just saw my heart rate jack from like 65 or whatever to 180, like that. He said it just, he thought I was, he thought I was dying. He thought that was literally it. And what had happened was they didn't put a nerve block in my arm. So when I woke up, I could feel everything that had happened. It was like, I rem- what I remember is the worst pain I've ever felt in my left arm and just screaming. Like, I, got, I think I got the arm close to my chest and I passed out. So that's when Dad saw, saw my, that. Yeah, Dad saw my heart rate go that high pull a hand on my chest and then dunk. Jeez. Out. Like I, yeah, I can't imagine what that was like, but there's, um, they, they had to give us, like in the first operation, they gave me like six times what the average, like 80 kilo man's volume of blood is. Mm. That's how much they pumped through me for that thing. They ended up using oh, you some really expensive plasma. Uh, you would have lost a lot with, you know, not just your legs, but the damage to Everything, all yeah. limbs. Yeah. yeah. So it was, um, and they did a really good job. It still baffles the doctors, like how, mm. how did it work? Like, you know, it's kind yeah. of one of those things where when my parents actually found out what they did was because my body was struggling to hold its warmth and they were like, we can't, if he can't hold his own warmth, he's going to die. So they'd, they'd done the operations that they could do. They just your equilibrium up. was just out of whack, yeah. Yeah, well, I'd had so much stuff pumped through me that... Oh, true. Yeah, yep. so they had a space blanket wrapped around me. And then, but when my family found out, like, you know, he's, he's run over a bomb, he's in a bit of shit. Mm. That was, that was just like, we don't know, it's touch and go now. You're probably looking a very small, single digit percent chance that he'll hold his heat. If his body doesn't hold his heat... Um, essentially you're getting a flag so yeah well they say it nicer than that but that's the that's the the nuts and bolts of it so yeah i don't know what it would like that i can't imagine what it'd be like to be on the other end of that Mm. i think that and that's one of the things i've dealt with since i get out is you know how like you were saying that ripple effect oh the the flow on it's it's my choice but it was my choice with know what I, I think everyone that's around me went through as well yeah you know it's good thinking of that and realizing it though so yeah well I mean there isn't much that you know there aren't too many times that you spend thinking about that but now I've got I've got a my little daughter and I've got a son who's coming in in June and nice yeah it's the best man it's the best ever mm. but it also that's like I can't mm. imagine like now I can't imagine anything happening to her 
Mm. You know, and it's only then that you come to the realization that so you're then someone you're looking else's back through your dad's lenses, yeah, yeah. through his eyes, yeah. and all of a sudden you're just like, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I put you guys through that. You know, like there's there's a lot of different emotions that go in. But my mm. my family were proud that I served. You know, my my granddad had. You know, my mom. Everyone was was into it. And I had this before I went to Afghanistan. My my one of my best one of my best mates. We were over in Canada. I used to spend time with each of them. Mm. Like I'd sort of go and do something before you deployed or before you went somewhere if you got warning or if sometimes right. when you're having a big exercise or something or if you heard you were going somewhere which sometimes you didn't end up doing mm-hmm. you go and spend some time he was in canada so he got a bit of extra time and um we we're there snowboarding and i was literally lecturing him about i'm like man we're 28 years old you're waiting tables in canada <laughs> like come on I've got an apartment that's, that's in, you know, in Sydney. I've got my, I've got my furniture with this and blah, 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 job security and all. Yeah, so yeah. I'm literally giving him this father lecture. Douchebag. And um, <laughs> he, oh, nice, thanks. He, yeah, and he's yeah. like, he looked at me when we were sitting there and he goes, right, when we're 80 years old and we're sitting in the same nursing home as each other, probably still drinking beer, I don't want to have to look at you and say, man, I sat on the sidelines. And like that, got in and had a crack. Yeah, mm. I yeah, I I sent it. You know, like I I've got stories to tell. Mm. And like I remember having, I remember that moment, hanging out with him in Whistler Village. And I think I, I that's been a really cool thing for like when you come back hurt mm. and stuff like that. And you you know, there's those moments where you're like trying to you're shutting everything off or you're just uncertain. How's my life going to be now? That's you know, it. What what goes on now? Because you're thinking of what was and now what's going to come of life moving forward. Now yeah. that mum's always, what does it look like? You know, like what? Yeah. What will I do? How's it going to be? And then you just start. How am I going to walk? Like what's? Gonna yeah. Be? What's? Why am I going to walk? And what am I going to do? And then all those different the different sort of processes. I mean, to me, I always looked at if I don't get up and walk and be as close now mm. as I was to before. The guy who buried the bomb beat me. And I'm so competitive, man. And I, how do you feel like, after that's happened, like towards, because who were they? Do you know? They were Taliban, yeah. They were Taliban, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So. They buried it trying to get me. I, you didn't really get me, did you? You know yeah. what I mean? Like it's. Still here. Yeah. One of those things. It's still here. You know, we Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's it. I mean, he that would beat me if I'd rolled over. You know, if I still breathing, over, if brother. I, yeah, if I committed suicide or something like that, if I that's not, been yeah. You know what I mean? Like mm. if I if I gave up on it, and plus they, those things are sort of disrespectful. Like I know what happened to the guys. You know, I know how hard it's been for all of them, and I'm not fucking. I'm always mindful of that. Mm. You know what I mean? And I can't. Imagine how frustrating that would fucking be. Mm. Mm. Can't sleep for can't sleep for nine years, and now he's decided. Nah, there's none of that shit. You know, you gotta mm. you gotta do it. I have a responsibility mm. to all of them now, and that's you know, and not just to be there for them, but to to use that chance they gave me to be able to do things. You mm. know, and sort of and really go out and give it give it a crack. Plus, I mean, it's kind of good. I don't mind it because people have always got this weird expectation of disabled people. Which I, I kind of like, cause I know. So, so to get pushed back into a corner and yeah, doors they, get locked and. But they also they always assume that you're not gonna be like it. Just amazes you know, people that you can do something really fucking it. normal. Yeah, you know, yeah. and you're like, yeah, you know, we are normal. It's just yeah. a different normal. Yeah, it's a different version of it. That's you know what it. I mean? I've I think it's the best thing ever. Pat you on the head. Yeah. 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 Good. Look at, You're having yeah. a crack. Good yeah, on you. Look, look at you go. Yeah. And you're just yeah. like, fuck, I hate really? that stuff. Man. Really? Are we doing that? Yeah. And like I, that it exists. Was, but I've watched, right. I, it put me in a position then when you get to say, originally the military guys were my clique. You mm. know, that's, that's what it was. A very select group of guys that did our job. Yeah. So how were they with you? Like after, Everyone was everyone was stoked, man. Now we're all because I think I. At the end of the day, you're alive, so I'm pretty happy go lucky too. Mm. Like you know, I mean, I don't you know I don't have to cut toenails anymore if he don't <laughs> smell. There's little things like that that are just 
they're the silver lining you know yeah. what i mean like i it's like me and me chair i've always got clean shoes mate you know the tread never hits the ground yeah you know? that, that's a thing 100 <laughs> yeah. percent. yeah i board the plane with the first class passengers i always get a part next to the door like there's hearing you yeah there's good there's, there's good things there's always silver lining with it like preach yeah so it's it's one of those sort of bits that i like it in, and then you've kind of to then become handicapped you realize how bad you were at dealing with it if it happened to anyone else around you but you always like it took me a while to understand that most people are well intentioned a majority of people unless they've got experience dealing with disabled people don't Mm. don't have just don't have that experience of doing it so don't really do it too well they don't verbalize what they're actually wanting to say and i only sort of sussed that out right we were snowboarding in Perisher and we had a blind guy mm-hmm. Liam Haven his name was and in conversation with other people I would always just be like a movie or something that you know you uh, hold on this guy was vision impaired and he was out there boarding in he, the yeah, state he was skiing oh skiing so, yeah. yeah so they have like they have guys who um take him as like guides yeah 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 and yeah it, like that was just that was cool in itself yeah and, like he would always do funny shit like we were doing a they were doing a photo of everyone still having a go having a crack yeah man tasting the fear right there but, yeah, but like you can hear where the noise comes from they're like all right everyone yep. everyone can you see the camera and you hear liam just go i didn't even know if i'm facing the right way <laughs> and he knew he knew that he had his back to everyone it was just hilarious but like i i said to him i'd always go oh man have you seen like going into a thing of a family guy or whatever and then oh fuck sorry man family guy. Yeah. yeah no but like i have you seen like no i haven't i'm blind you know what i mean like mm, but mm. then i catch myself doing it and i'd be like look i'm probably gonna do that more it's just a figure of speech that i got i'm sorry if it insults you he goes like why why would it insult me the only thing that makes it like makes me uneasy is the fact that you're uneasy talking about it and when he said that, I kind of yeah, just But it's went, good just, yeah, you're being honest, brother, yeah, you know? But like that, but that kind of then gave me an empathy for people who had, who were really trying to help me deal with where I was. You okay. know what I mean? Like okay. that they, there's a lot, there's a lot going on for people who you're friends with, you'd know this, who then yeah. speak to you afterwards and all they want to do is tell you it's going to be all right. But mm. when you're like, I know it's going to be all right. I'm me. I'm fucking, I'm just still me. And it's always, yeah, and it's always interesting talking to people that have had an acquired disability or talking to people that are born with that particular disability, you know, like whether it's physical or intellectual or cognitive and just trying to understand that but just being honest and talking about it. And it's funny, like what we're talking about um, beforehand, like if it's different disabilities but you still on that plane on that level but you can where it's the same but different but yeah, it's yeah. just opening up that path to have that conversation yeah and just being real and yeah. open and honest you yeah know? that's it i mean in those bits like i found i found that hard like I was, we were snowboarding with a guy who um he uh he was killed in spain he actually stacked one of the the tabletops and it broke his neck his neck and his back yeah uh, but I was talking to him. He had a short arms, yeah, th- uh, thalidomide. Yep. Kid. Yep. And um, yep. I remember I was like, I remember saying to him because I'm used to guys just being so open, truthful, and honest that if something was was pretty ordinary, you knew about it. Mm. You know, like they would, everyone would just say how it was because that's how you know you can trust someone. Yeah. If they call something that's shit, something that's shit, and don't silver lining it, that's See, okay, cool. Just tell it how it is. Yeah, that's thing. I get this guy. Matty was never like that. He was always yeah. so nice. There was always a reason for what could potentially be causing the traffic jam or whatever and stuff. And I remember saying to him, like, we were we were a fair few wines deep. Yeah. And I was like, Matty, you're always so nice. I just, I want you to swear or I want you to just, something that frustrates you, show me it frustrates you because it worries me, man. Like, it honestly makes me go. Like, you could sort of tell he's holding a lot in yeah, there. Yeah, and I'm just like, mate, like, trust me, we're, mm. we're, guy, we're, we're friends now. You can be annoyed with something mm. and I'm not going to go, geez, this guy's a hindrance. You know what I mean? And he just looked at me and he just goes, man, but sorry, it's just habit. Mm. I said, what do you mean habit? And he goes, kids are cruel. Oh, mate. And yep. when, he, when he said that, 
all of a sudden, like I'd only been hurt for probably two years and I was like, oh my God, I don't know the first thing about this. Like it's such a different storm for yeah. everyone that's in it. And like that was kind of a good moment to be able to then not, not think, you know, that you know the first thing about how someone or why someone, you know, depending on there's so many different circumstances that randomly change things. That's right. You know, that, yeah, that was, it was a really good moment through, through that process of dealing with stuff. Cause you know, at different stages, I had a mate who came in and he brought, um, he brought a book that had racing wheelchairs in it. And like my arms are pretty badly messed up. Like this one doesn't go straight oh, okay. anymore. Like, okay. You know, straight. Yeah. This one is, that's how you hand it normally be flat. That's as far around as it goes. Yeah. Right. So like there's little things like that, but he's like, oh, look at this. I'm like, what is this man? And he's like, dude, you could be the next Kurt Fernley. I'm just like, bro, so could you. You don't have to be injured to race a wheelchair. Mm. You know, that was like what I, and I, you could see him look and, and like, I know what the face meant now. The face just meant, man, I'm just trying to support you. But I was literally insulted going, well, like, like now I'm hurt. I've got to race wheelchairs. Like, really? I just want to get back on a surfboard or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, it just, why do I want your, to change? You want to try and find your normal, yeah? Yeah, something that sort of does that. But it, it, And that was the sort of balance, you know? It's like the, he's well-intentioned, you know? He's coming in to try and be, just give me a, a helping hand. You know what I mean? Like, show yeah. me that the door doesn't have to shut. And I'm like, but it... And I've seen had. how that's sort of hard to see on both sides of the fence too, where... You do have that person that's, you know, born with that disability and where you've got the person with the ear quiet and sometimes it can't can't see eye to eye or where you've got that person where... Because I know people that have got disabilities, whether they're born with them, and it's just eternal frustration. And, and it's, you know, circumstance plus not just a disability, but there's all sorts of other factors that come in plus just who they are as a person. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's tough, but, yeah, and I, I find that hard, you know, and I try and talk to people and try and find the best in them and trying to, you know, explore that, you yeah, know, yeah. because life, you know, I'm just glad I'm still breathing, like, the yeah, same yeah. with you and yeah, yeah. and like you know acquired disabilities and but you know some people can't find it but I try and try and help navigate the path to help people find a way yeah, not everybody's yeah. going to and people get stuck in certain circumstances and it is what it is yeah, yeah. but it's good if people can find a way no matter the disability that. or whatever it is or if it's able-bodied like you know Shan here or Whatever circumstance in life you're in, if you yeah. can find a way. See, but I, what the thing that I sort of got was, like, I had trouble initially with the label, disability. You know, yeah, yeah I didn't, I didn't like that. I never liked. I, n I don't know whether I ever liked any label except for Commando. <laughs> that was, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's it's an inherently cool one, the Commando one, but you can't tell anyone. Really, yeah, because is it like because you're like 22. you're looking at other people <laughs> uh, with disabilities and you're like, I belong in this section now. See, but that the way I originally looked at it, like now they're my click. I can't wait until I see like there's a crew, there's all the disabled golfers. I get no, I get it, I get a good bit of oh, my no, no better social joy. Like nothing that goes close to my family, but no greater social joy than hanging out with the disabled golfers. And they're all, everyone's so different from so many different places. I mean, everyone's just yeah. bonded over golf. Some people are missing legs, some missing hands, some intellectually disabled, whatever. And it was like, I went to Queensland to Redcliffe. We played before and I was looking forward to it for so long, went there and just literally when we're sitting there after a round, everyone's bannering about yeah. stuff. And I like looked around and I've gone, finally, it's been... 12 years and you just accept that this is your click now <laughs> you know this is what this yeah. is the thing that sometimes you sort of it takes that to. you know yeah well i mean i i got angry with people then like i had a bit of a superiority complex with people like oh okay well you know it's special because you've got it and i'm like i just can't run 
That's literally the only mm. thing. You know, I mean, my arms are a bit different, but like if someone's got glasses, I'll take your glasses off mm. and then who's disabled? Yeah, yeah. You're going to trip over the same step that I've got to slowly walk up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and then there's different things where some people can't, can't jog or yeah. whatever. Like, and you're like, it, so how, where's the line where you go, oh, this person is disabled or whatever? Like, I had a real thing. I think it's until you see people like Dylan. Mm. You know, you watch, you watch oh, Dylan Alcott. Alcott. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you watch him do stuff. I worked with him on the Invictus Games. Oh, which is something. I That's awesome. Story. I brought this for you. Yeah? Yeah. What's this? This is, this is my Team Australia coin from the Invictus Games. You get to give it to someone. So that's, that's what? yours now. So, yeah. It's my coin from there. It's now your coin from, the, uh, from Australia's uh, Team Invictus. Come on, man. True story. It's yours. So I was, working with, nah. I was working with Dylan on that, right? And he just blew my mind with the way that he... He just like he's got a presence that's just was just so big. Like all of a sudden, he was the first person who made me want to say, "Okay, I'm one of them. I'm proud. Yeah. I'm proud. Yeah, that's I'm a, awesome. I'm you know, I can feel like that him. when I watch him on, you know, on the TV or if you know, phone or whatever. You can feel that presence yeah. from him. Yeah, and he's just like I kind of like. He's so matter of fact with stuff that like he goes because like why I he goes I watch TV. There's you no know, bullshit with I, that yeah, guy. Hey? I watched TV and I thought, well, why can't I do that? Because I'm a disabled guy. No, that's not a good enough reason. And now he's doing it. You know what I mean? And he's phenomenal to work with. Like there was mm. that was one of my first rodeos, but you can still see when someone's good. They had him, uh, Limo and Chris Bath. Yep, yep, yep. And like they're just, you know, they're all so professional at it. But Dylan just, you know, it had, it had me kind of. That was one of the one of the major. Sort of turning points with it, you know, like you're there and you're just, okay, that's, so yeah, I get it. I want to, I want to be one of those guys. Let's that's look awesome. At that. That's mad. Yeah. So he was. And, man, knuckles on. <laughs> oh, Reggie. We'll get okay. it later. Look, bonus, I can't, can I can't reach far. because of the things. It's yeah. all good. Yeah. We're air knuckles. We'll it's get like there. It's fist pump. Boom, yeah, boom. we will. We'll, 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 we'll get it. <laughs> yeah. But going back to, like, it always intrigues me and, you know, the marvel of disabilities and people how they cope with it or and how you know they're moving forward and just what they feel and think and say with yourself with the rehabilitation process and just going through too slow everything was too slow too slow and what about everything was what even with the prosthetics and trying to mold them like well, look, and phantom pain or i'll get intrigued by all that sort of stuff yeah you know? phantom pain was it was, it was really bad but i got I was had morphine in the hospital, right? And I could feel my right foot. Okay, it's really weird. So you get a tickle between your toes. And you've never had a tickle between your toes. Like if I ask anyone who's got feet and go, what does a tickle between your toes feel like? And they'll be like, I can kind of imagine it, but you never get one. Right. I was getting them. And I got the shits with it. So I started slapping the edge at the end of my stump. Like I just started right. cracking it, just going, ah, yeah. and it stopped. Just all of a sudden, like it just basically in my mind was like, yeah, they stopped there. Does that exacerbate it? Like my if you're thinking gonna, about it more, like does, like the tickling or the pain sort of. It's just confusing. Like it's like if you wake up and you've got a dead arm and then you feel it there, you're like, I, I know that's my arm, but I'm not getting any mm. signal back from it. Like that was that was like that was the hard, one of the harder bits for me like to cope mm. with mentally when everything's happening was you know your arm my arms are messed up, I was fuming that I couldn't work out and I'm in a hospital and I couldn't, I could close my hand, mm. but I couldn't open it, so I could pick stuff up with it but that's my left hand I'm left-handed I couldn't write mm. I couldn't do anything, like all of these different things and I'm like, so this is this is it now. And it, like, and it, that was... And just thinking, is this going to get any better? And the yes, frustration of it? The, yeah, right. and I'm literally looking at something that I could go like that with before. Yeah. That doesn't do it. And you just... I'm, I'm hearing you, those oh, simple I'm, things. Yeah, and then know, really... You take for granted. Yeah, and that was the sort mm. of thing that was going through. And it's just a huge adjustment. Like, I think emotionally, I was literally doing research about them growing limbs back mm. in the US. They had a... 
got a multi-billion dollar yeah. program that they were putting together to grow limbs back. And I'm like, but the, log- <laughs> the logical guy that's yeah. in me just goes, if they're going to grow limbs back, they're going to grow hearts for people, they're going to do this. There's so many different things. It's so far down the list of yeah. things that they can do. It's all, what can we do now? Yeah, what what's happening now? And then I remember getting like first sorting out how to walk. The hard thing is you don't know what it's supposed to feel like. You know, and I wasn't used to relying on people for things and all of a sudden I had to rely on a different team. Mm. You know, I had, a, I had a prosthetist, I had physios, had that. And, like, I knew that none of them had dealt with anyone. Like, I was the worst injured soldier that we'd had since the yeah. Vietnam War. And they're all a part of the, the army in some way, like in no, Germany or no? No, this was back in Australia. Oh, so, so this landed, has come yeah, back. So you surgeons and all that sort of stuff was all in Sydney. Yeah, so. right. Yeah, and then... So which hospital were you in in Sydney? North Shore Private. Yeah, okay. So yeah, yeah, I yeah, there yeah, and I had Andrew Ellis. He was the head ortho surgeon of everything. And then I went out to a rehab hospital at Taramara. And um, that was hard. There's like a lot of like older people in the rehab hospital that had hip replacements and stuff. And like I was, you know, I'm used to being able to... Yeah, what am I doing here? Yeah, but like people then going, all right, cool. This is the end state that we need. Don't talk to me again until you've done it. I don't want to see you again until you've done it. I'll see you in a week, you know, and then coming back and it's done. Mm. You know, you can work under your own steam doing stuff like that. Here, it it felt so micromanaged. You know what I mean? Like everything was, oh, no, and then baby steps. We're going to get you to do this. Who are you to think that you're telling me how quick I'm going to go? Are you kidding me? I remember hitting a floor to ceiling ball. Mm which my arm was still infected and they're still a little broken, but I could do it. And she grabbed it and goes, you can't use that. You're not qualified. Like, <laughs> Qualified? Oh, yeah. I'm like, I used, you know, right, my background, don't you? Yeah. And she's like, well, yeah. I'm like, cool. So they t- trust me with the most dangerous weapons our country has ever bought. And you're telling me about qualified for a floor to ceiling ball? Are you <laughs> kidding? <laughs> like, what, what are you talking about? And then she's gone, oh, this and liability and blah, blah, blah. Oh, you're fired. So that was the last session I did with that physio. And then... Um, See you later, pack your bags. Yeah, I got a bit of a reputation for doing that because if I didn't really get where I was going, I'd be like, okay, cool, we just don't have the same vision. I can't... Yeah, I understand, you know, like the frustration of it because you're looking at a point that you want to be. I want to get And it, you're yeah. getting held back. Yeah, and if, if we're not going at my... Like, I'm going to go at that pace. Because you know your body too, even though you're in the situation that you are that you were in but it's like you can feel and know yeah that you can get to a certain point I yeah go. i want to keep going i want to mm. keep going i want to keep going oh, and then it's yeah. then you got this oh no and then we'll no no we're not no. going to rest we're not going to do that i'm not now i like and, and that's the thing why they told me how quick my recovery was when i spoke to the doctors the period of time that i had from when i was injured to mm. being able to walk six weeks after they're like your recovery time was just was stupid how quick that first part happened you know it usually takes people so long and i'm like why is in a job where you're literally you might have to do a 48 hour task one night and you get six hours to shower clean up eat sleep wake up repeat your body literally is on that clock so i'm probably the best person to have that type of thing happen to because my body just knows okay cool it's just different shit i've got to fix this time yeah yeah you know and like then you'd be yeah, I, I remember feeling really held back to the point where I went to the, we had like, I was a horrific patient. I was always impatient, always angry, and they had parallel bars. Yep. And I just had to sit there in my half hour physio session I'd get and watch old people walk with their hip replacements in it and then when it got round to my go i could do my two or three laps and i was like and how was it like doing like getting balance at first because it's not like with your legs there they'll both like blown off at the sort of same length like is one one's a little bit shorter than yeah, the other one's one's below knee and one's above knee one's pretty high yeah so it was it was it's like tricky? it felt like a trot yeah yeah it felt okay. kind of like a trot because you don't you're so used to everything firing symmetrically and working well yeah whereas now it was heel step move then that heel you have to know that the knee the foot's got enough weight on it so that the knee breaks and swings through then 
clicks out then goes down like you can feel all those things they haven't become muscle memory mm. but when they so you had to kind of retrain your brain but i found it hard then to do it for six minutes you know what i mean maximum and then be back in a wheelchair then back to the room and Dora, we'll do that next thing tomorrow i'm like why let's do that now so i went to the gym i thought this is this is not cool i'm just gonna go there was light that shone in from the car park where it was I went and tested the door mm. and it was unlocked. So I'm like, cool, wait, we're going to do this. We're going to do it my way. Yeah. I went in and I walked a couple of laps and then I had one of the weights out. I'm literally doing like bicep curls. I can remember and I still don't know why bicep curls, but because let's face it, you're just being blown up. You need beach muscles. Yeah. So I'm, <laughs> I'm doing those and this lady walks yeah. in and just goes, you can't be in here. I'm like, why is that love? She goes, you're unsupervised. And you're, do us a favor. Go and grab someone to supervise me then, yeah? To do kills. She lost her mind at me. I am used to being yelled at and used to dealing with it with a similar sort of aggression. Yeah, yeah. So we had an argument. She walked out. I like wheelchair stormed out, which I think is just like aggressive pushing. I'm yeah. not sure. But like nah. then this nurse comes I know through. what that's like. Yeah, <laughs> they're like, yeah. Oh, come on, fucking <laughs> And then this, this nurse came the next day and I had two breakfasts. And I thought, they're trying to kill me. They're doing She's done it. It's plausible deniability. I don't know what breakfast, blah, blah, blah. So I was like literally just going, okay. And she goes, you know that lady who you told to go fuck herself yesterday? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, yes, I do. She goes, she's the CEO. And when she said that, I was just like, oh. Dude. Yeah, I'm like rehearsing what I'm going to say to General Alexander when he calls in my head. And then yep. she just goes, and we all hate her. So I'd literally told the Wicked Witch of the West to get out of the room and all of the nurses. I went from zero to hero in one <laughs> argument. Like all of a sudden and then they started bringing me like there was flavoured milk. They would get things from the sandwich bar. I'd get to go to the gym whenever I wanted. Nice. But they would take me there and it, that kind of helped through that. Yeah. Through that, yeah. Fa that phase of things. But And what was the goal setting that yet? Because obviously you just thought, yeah, got to get better, going to get on the parallel bars, do whatever I have to do to physically and mentally get to a place. But – Get me what? out of hospital. Out of hospital? Get me out of hospital, but more important, like, it was see the boys. Mm. Like, the boys were getting home. I knew I had about, because our deployment was lasting just less than five months. So mm. I had probably three okay. that I had to be walking to the point where I could stand and meet them when they got off the plane. Because I wanted their first thought when they got home that was, okay, so he's still with us. We didn't, yeah, we didn't lose him. Sweet. Type thing. Mm. You know, I wanted that. Thing, which like when I got there and that was that was pretty cool to be standing there. My whole team stood behind me and you know, everyone shook my hand on the way through. And it like talking to them after it, that meant a lot to a lot of guys who were there. Everyone yeah. had had that lost that little bit of their soul when that thing happened, sort of got it back, if only for a while. Mm. Which was you know, it makes it makes it worth it, you know, it makes all the pain and whatever else went with getting there. But to me that was the just seeing your recovery and just how you are as a person and yeah. just being able to talk to them about it, yeah? Yeah, I mean, like, and I had, I had some different things that were, I think, tough when it comes to dealing with some of the different moving parts that you got to deal with when it comes to prosthetics especially. Um, there, God, how do you word this to not get sued? <laughs> take your time um, take your time think about it brother. yeah you can edit you can yeah. cut it out <laughs> all right sweet well i, I didn't i kind of was getting promised a lot of things that weren't exactly factual so i'd put myself through i just thought that amount of pain was what i had to go through right like i'd literally come to grips with this is how your life is now yeah you're gonna do it and you're gonna make it look easy like that's what i'm telling myself as i'm literally like in agony doing it you know what i mean like and then on that same trip that the blind guy was on we had a different prosthetist come down and right. he goes oh i'm just gonna do you mind if i look at some of your stuff i'm like yeah no worries and i was always pretty direct with the guy i was with i'm like literally we've got a pretty big budget like let's just get the latest best greatest stuff that there is yeah. like honestly just let's go to town figure yeah, out yeah that's it max out like honestly, carbon fiber out. whatever else yeah is in everything there. latest technology so i'm looking up everything that i sort of can not knowing where to look and what to do and i had like even the baloney side was 
the setup that I had on it, the guy's gone, why have you got, why are you using a pin liner with that? And I'm like, I, dude, I'm not a prosthetist. I don't know. What are you, what are you talking about? Mm. And he goes, I'd probably do this. Give me a look at the other one. And I showed it to him and he's gone, that's a quad socket. That I haven't made one for someone like that since like the early 90s. And like this penny dropped that there was a guy who was kind of raking a system a touch. The thing, I like, I don't mind that if someone, if someone thinks, you know, that's their way of doing the, if they're just a shit businessman, that's, that's their problem. My problem is when it's hurting me to do it, like that, that made me like, cause I, cause you would have been feel, feeling like that's, that's making you, you, that's pushing you backwards essentially. Yeah, but this, this is literally, I, I feel it every single step that I take. Right, and you've cut a corner yeah, okay. to make something that's cheap dog shit so that you can put an extra couple of grand in your back pocket. You're oh. impacting me walking, bro. Mate, anything with disability, that would have... I can I see the frustration on your brother. lost it. And yeah. then when I... Because I got fitted then, right? So I got fitted and the new things, I rang this guy. His name was his name was Kevin Harrison, yeah. the guy who I went to see. He was in Melbourne the army were great. They flew me down and did everything because they didn't have any experience with it. But Just got people taking advantage. It's bullshit, a bit, man. Like, like, oh, I fucking called this guy. Yeah. I called him every day for the next like two weeks. Just mm. going, I can't believe this. Mm. They can walk and it doesn't hurt. This is this feels great. And that does this. And he goes, yeah, that's just how that. That's pretty normal. Supposed to be a line. Yeah. That's, that's just what it is. And like then I get angry. But this this got me. This honestly do you know that sucks that happens that's happened to you think how many how the amount of people that would have went through the same thing man but i got ripped yeah see but i was lucky i had a general i could speak to who i had a direct line to where Mm. if it wasn't working i I could basically say and this is my evidence with it it didn't have to filter up through a chain of command it was just me to him and i had a colonel who was looking after it as well so they're pretty lofty ranks Mm. and um God, I remember the argument. The thing that actually really, I was, I was lucky in that sense. And that's another thing that made me angry. What if someone didn't have the amount of support that I had mm. and then has someone doing that to rip their eyes out? I was like, but this was the end. This was the end with me. I got called up to like my boss's office. He's the colonel that's in charge of my unit. Mm. I don't worry. <laughs> Walk in, like, hey, what's happening, boss? How are you, mate? He goes, oh, I'm all right, I'm all right. You know, they've got this new structure and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, okay, what's that? And he goes, well, our unit's got to, um, we've got to pay for the prosthetic componentry and stuff now. So Army Health's done a thing in there. Now, just the way that the pool, the money pool right, has right. changed. And I'd been swimming with him before right and i went to the prosthetist i said this old socket that we used on my leg can we i've got a man of blade which i took in and i said hey can we stick these two things together because i need my ass to be buoyant when i swim right because otherwise it, it sinks every time i swim if i swim without a fit on now my ass sinks it's horrible it's hard yeah. so what do you say is it a universal or is this just for water or a universal just, just for water okay so just a swimming prosthetic and right. he's like okay. this guy's like oh it won't work it won't work i'm like I, you don't get paid to tell me what will work. No. Just it all comes down to do the it. user. Yeah, that's it. Do it and see how we go. And now I've seen so many of them. Like, but all they literally stuck it on with like aerodite and put tape around it. There was literally still a sticky tape. When I did this segment with Ray Martin, he made a joke about it. Like, <laughs> just go, man. It looks like it's looks like you made it in the backyard. And I think that's what brought the boss's attention to it because he dragged me in and he goes, look. So we've got to pay for these things now. Um, mm. So we've kind of got to, let's try and make them functional or whatever. You know that leg you've got? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, the, the fin. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, uh, we're just really struggling to work out how and why that cost our unit $4,500. Hold on, that thing that's been arrow dieted. Arrow dieted to an old socket, right? And I said, what? 
anything to do with so, yeah, disability but, along along the lines of the price goes. Yeah, but like, but check this out, right? He's then gone. Out, man. Do you know how many rounds of ammunition that is to train one of our guys? Like, and I'm like, sir, to be fucking honest, I I don't see any of the bills. And then the Ray Martin thing came out in 60 minutes and the company that billed us that put me as their thing on Facebook. So if you Googled like my name, that was the first thing that came up. And I was like, okay, cool. They're going to have to get a letter off a lawyer now, you know, to, to get it down off there. And by that stage I'd That's had my legs. absolute like the other guy. man. I was fuming. Like honestly, I was fuming. But to the point where like, yeah, it just, that sort of junk just should not happen, period. No, I mean, anyone, should, no should is a dangerous word to be using anywhere. But, like, that was sort of, for me, that was the first time I'd stepped out into work. In the army, you couldn't do it. You couldn't. Accountability. If someone did that in the military, that would be done. That's the end of your job. You're out of the unit. You're done. And I honestly thought the team around me, everyone was going to just be doing what they could to do what we did in the army, which is mm. make the guy next to them better so that yeah, everyone's it. better. Uplift and, as and a I, team. Yeah, and I just didn't understand how someone could go, all right, well, I'll, I'll rip him off with this because then he'll have to stay and then it's on my advice. I'm like, dude, you could literally fit me with the most expensive, most recent prosthetics at every six months for the rest of my life. How could you be so nearsighted that you go, well, if we charge him a ton for this one, then we'll, it just, it didn't. Yeah, and the bills just, will just keep racking up, racking yeah, up, racking I just, up. Oh, but the, to me, the thing that was insulting about it was, it's my comfort that you're messing with. Mm. You know what I mean? You're literally lying to me about how prosthetic life is in the first year that I've been an amputee. Yeah, it all comes down to the user and what you feel comfortable with walking on yeah i mean and at least trying different so you're not solutions feeling those pins or whatever it may be yeah see i mean to, but to me as well i had people because i was always really angry with him after mm. that i was just like man the dude's just a he's off my radar he's definitely off my christmas list and i had someone go well, but what if he's that's the best that he could do and i'm like i don't care if it's the best you could do if that's the best you can do that's what you say you say look this is the best i've got mm. i can do this it may work doing something else like that. This may work. This is also a solution. This is that. This is this. As opposed to going, this is the latest technology that you can possibly have. This will be the most comfortable. Mm. Like especially when you're lying as openly as he was. And But I mean that in itself was me still working out how to, you know, how to deal with being an amputee and just even if you're getting an operation, you're always entitled to a second opinion. That's you know right. what I mean? And some people can be, that can literally be someone wanting to do the best by you. Like yeah. not everyone's a dodgy. And like what we were talking about before, like that, you know, still happens now. Like it can be night and day between, you know, OTs or if it's other, you know, allied health professionals out there and you are entitled to different opinions and you can see, you know, what's true to form and, what's really not going to fit within this disability or this health situation. And it's yeah. like, well, no, we're going to have to go with the people that, you know, are trustworthy and are doing the right work yeah. and are not taking advantage because there's plenty I mean, of professionals out there that take advantage like what you've gone through. Yeah, so. But there's also like, I mean, there's also people who are truly passionate about getting the best outcome. Oh, 100%. You know, like, and I think the amount of people, like he, there's maybe been... There's been a few that have tried to sort of do stuff mm. in their own way. I mean, I think with with the DVA card that comes with it, most of them then see mm. a pot and it's a pot of money that you're not paying for so their price may change because no one likes the fact they have to pay tax, mm. you know, but they still happily will drink water, drive on the roads, wearing the seatbelt and all these different things that their mm. taxes pay for, mm. you know what I mean? Like live in a re really well-regulated country that literally has its game together like no other place that you'll live mm. but still complain about taxes. Um, but, yeah, I, I think most most people that I've dealt with, you know, like a really – especially the ones – I think they're the ones that you got to sort of hold on to, ones that really, really care. Have care a, and know their stuff. Yeah, have a really vested interest in you getting the best and, – and then that's what they judge how well they do their job by. 
Yeah. You know, if, you, if their client satisfaction is the thing that really makes them go, like really gets them, gets them buzzing, typically those people just always head and shoulders above others that you'll deal with, don't they? 100%. So how are you going all with it now, like with the prosthetics and like with what's out there with choice and what gets you, you know, essentially walking every day? I mean, mine, I'm happy with it now. There's always room to tweak bits. Um, there's, I'm really genuinely happy with the way that the process is working. Plus, I'm far enough through it to get the ins and outs of it. I mean, I still occasionally forget to charge my leg. There's, there's little bits with it, but... Hold yeah. on, charge? Yeah, man, there's a, there's a microchip in the, the prosthetic knee. Yeah. It's got sensors, so you got to charge it. It's got like a five-day battery life. But for some reason, my walking leg, I always remember, it's the golf leg. Because I've got a specific leg for playing yeah. golf. Because you've got to have a spare walking leg. You have to have two of the prosthetic knees so that if one fails, you've got the other one. Yeah. So I set my other one up as a golf leg. And it's just for playing golf. And I've been in two tournaments so far where I've got to the last day, playing the last round, and then this leg starts beeping under me. And if it gets past five, yeah, but yeah, but it's like we've got to charge the leg. I'm like, man, we're on the twelfth hole. What? How are we going to charge the leg? And I'm, uh, and I've done it twice. Like I'm the, I'm like I'm literally the dumb bastard that just (laughs) forgot about it. But I mean, I'm really glad, honestly, with the way that like my prosthetics and stuff are. I found that having. Sydney coast, Newcastle, where? Dark coast. Yep. Boris's beach now. So I was in Coogee nice. for, I got Coogee, Bondi for the first five years, then across to um to Coogee. I bought a place when I was first injured and then ended up moving into it for sort of five years, then moved up uh, January last year. Yep. And yeah, it's it's kind of good because I grew up here. There's something like my I live across the road from my year one teacher. Yeah, seriously. Right. Like, t- and two doors down is one of my best mates' brother's best mate lives there. Like, it's re- yeah. it's really funny. I moved into a street. It's like it's Ramsey Street, man. We moved in, and everyone knows each other or they know stuff. But it's hard for me. Like coming back was it was good, but I don't like the person I was before it. So mm. like, it's kind of like when I meet people. There's so much water that's gone under the bridge. I, you know, you almost want a chance to. And you've learned a lot though. You know, you've gone through a lot. So, I mean, it wasn't that bad. I think it was just more, it was more my perception of it. I was just like. Yeah. And being a youngster and just, you know, being somewhere that you want to be and just trying to mold into, trying to find out who you are. Yeah. But going back to, so what was your first Anzac day like? When this is, I'm talking post 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 injury. Yeah. Scary. I was in, I was at Bondi and um, my experience prior to that, if you told girls, because the, or like this is the, the broad opinion, it only happened a few times, but I remember telling girls when we're at the pub at, at Ramwick or at the Coogee Bay Hotel, you'd eventually go, you'd know them and to the point where you could say, oh, I, I'm in the army. You'd never say which part of what you did in the army. Mm. So I'm just, you know, I serve in the army. And then they'd be, oh, okay. you know, the amount of things that you get is of a baby killer or stuff like you get these really random, yeah. like. I think it's just going to be some bloodthirsty person that's out there. Yeah, 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 you get kind of that type of stuff that, you know, I, I was really worried. When we were first walking to the the dawn service at Bondi, I'm walking along the Esplanade there and I have my medals on in a suit. That's our dress for Anzac Day. It's a black suit with medals. And or any any suit as long as it's presentable with medals. A lot of emotions. Yeah, and I was walking and I just remember hearing someone yelled something out a window and I was like, No, you're gonna go. You're gonna just go. Just walk down, it'll be fine. We walked down to um to the RSL at North Bondi and just it was there was probably seven thousand people and all like in Bondi I really like as a place because everyone has the right to be themselves, mm. to wear what they want to wear, to do things their own way. And rather than ever being judged for it, people just kind of look. And if it's, a, if it's something you like, you'll maybe do it as well. You know, that's the only place I've ever lived where I've gone shopping and just gone, now all I have to do is buy what I like, what I think suits me. I don't have to follow any type of fashion. Mm. I don't have to do any of that, which is good because I just had my legs blown off and skinny jeans were cool. 
So it was like, it was a good yeah. place to. You feel like you can get around and you're not getting judged or looked at. Yeah, or so you had like. people with like the emo fringes and all these fashionable haircuts and that sort of stuff that were still up first thing in the morning for the dawn service. Mm. Like that was like my first thing of going, so people people care. This is, all right, they're caring, they're not judging, they're not doing anything that's... Was everything flooding back as well from what had happened or anything like that? Or not really. I've, had, I've only had probably I have three or four real flashback type things, but I can't see anything with them. Mm. I just go, doesn't that feel like, ugh, and now I can sort of switch it on a bit. Like I felt it a touch then, mm. but like what that shockwave and it feels like. And like I've had it, I've had it a couple of times where it's just yeah. shut me down for like four hours. Yeah. Literally haven't been able to do anything, you know, yeah. which is really, it's a really weird feeling. Yeah. You know, it's really, it's hard to describe. It's like, imagine that anxiety that cripples you to the point you can't move. Yep. That's yep. that's it, you know, and um, yeah, it creeps up. Just yeah, here and there. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of weird like that. So it's like, I think, yeah, I, I, it was well, never really for me and yeah. anyone who's in our job. Like it's Anzac Day is not the day that you think about it. No, nah. you think about it every day. It's like that's always it's always hard doing interviews or something on Anzac Day because mm. I'm like, oh, so you think about the boys today, and I'm like, I think about the boys every day. Mm. You know, is this the time that you pay respect to that? I'm like, no, I've got But their it's photos. always there. Yeah, yeah. I've got their photos on my wall at home. I see them yeah. any time I go to my desk. It's not like it's just switched on for Yeah, that's day. the thing. I don't just yeah. go, okay, no, now's just the day it's that part of who we, you are. Yeah, the, yeah, now's the day that we wear metal so that everyone doesn't have to think about it every day. Yep, yep, true. You know, and that's – so that's that's sort of it, I think, the main thing. And it's, it's kind of cool to see the way that Australians really respect it. Yeah. You know, Australians are really, really cool when it comes to it, even though people people will typically yeah, it doesn't want to matter. ask the question, but yeah, what side of the fence you're on and if you believe in like if it's got to do with war, whatever it is, but when it comes to Anzac Day and the respect of as a nation, like you can just see how everybody comes together, yeah. no matter what the belief is, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean and like I guess the bottom line when you when you think about it is in an ideal world, if you want war, you're a psychopath. You need to have your head red um, and preferably just lock yourself in a room somewhere because mm. you're a danger. Um, but, like, the, in the real world, you know, empires were, were founded on it, you know, and unfortunately, if everything does go pear-shaped, Australia, that we just don't have enough people. We're going to need allies. We yeah, really we're are, only man. like, you know, we got 20 odd million yeah, compared man. to we've got, looking at the states and it's 330 yeah, something million. We got the it. population of California, you know, and not even the less, whole population. Less. Yeah, that's there it. There were we 40. Got, yeah, we got less than the population <laughs> of California. And, you know, when you're asking why, and, oh, it was a political thing. Yeah, because that could keep us alive. Yeah, it's just, well, that's it. It's hard to know. And then you've got all the political background and drama that's going on and just yeah. where the world is sort of balancing out but yeah but mate like when you were talking about shockwaves which is you know major when you talk like scott palmer scotty yeah yeah and then but the positives that you know come out of that when you what like with his old man and then what you did over overseas over in png yeah. that is that's awesome stuff like what did that feel like like take like doing it for your mate and but doing it with his old man and what walking along that track and then walking along that track but you know on a new set of legs and just going through the different surfaces through the tropics with the the mud and the water and the rain and everything like that what what i did so much of it with crutches because that's the legs reasonably heavy so to be going up like hill or downhill with it was hard so i got mm. one of the porters to carry the leg and i just used crutches for most of it yeah but like when when i was doing it with ray the first thing that i saw was i saw scotty's dad who was never going to be able to speak to scotty again you know he was going to look at an empty seat at a table at christmas time that's hard and that was is gut-wrenching to do and he mm. was telling me about scotty getting out of the army and what he was going to do and i was yeah, then he just said, look, I want to walk the Kokoda track. I wanted to walk it with Scotty, but now I want to walk it with you. 
And I was just like, okay. Was that pretty overwhelming when cool. he hit you up? Yeah. Well, it was, yeah, but I think I, you know, I did what Scotty would have done for my dad and just said, yeah, let's do it. 100%. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and that's, that's what it comes down to. And I mean, it was hard physically. It was hard. It was the hardest thing about it, to be honest, was the guy who was doing it was selling a book and whatever about the great work he was doing to help soldiers so me and ray went to do it as a tribute to scotty but we had cameras in our face the whole time trying to sell a broken soldier story for a guy who was oh really yeah that's so that i mean that that was the tough bit with it Far you know, for, out, what, man. for what we got out of it you know it was great but then the hard bit it kind of got tarnished a bit by watching I almost it. like get the fuck away from me sort of thing or? so we we knew it was going to be there but we didn't know what their pitch was what was the angle that they were taking you know and the angle was like this guy's book which is walking walking wounded you know they they wanted to sort of take that angle we didn't know that so they were trying to sort of get us when we were tired or whatever to talk oh, about stuff and come on man hey man that's why i just won't you know channel seven could ring all they want and i just won't speak to them about it i mean that that was sort of that that made it difficult i think after it we got a lot out of it we got a huge bit out of being on the trip and doing that but then it was like for me it was nearly impossible i watched this special that's driving me nuts bro yeah i watched this special and they showed me different footage when i went in to watch it get cut than what got shown and like they're just just, clipping the bits that they want yeah they clip little bits together of it just so that it suited the narrative to do it with this um book the guy was releasing so it was i mean that made that may kick out of heart, but in the reality of the real world, that was another thing, like the prosthetist that I needed to happen to put me in a spot. Like I'd been spoken to about getting a, a manager and someone to look after what I do when it comes to those sort of things so that then I have a guy who's trained in this sort of stuff. who And can people see ask. what they're doing, yeah? Yeah, and he can vet the yeah, things before okay. it happens. He's got to get a clear statement. He can yep. then go, well, before it's released, we're doing this, we're doing that. And he can also run me through how media works. And what you're going to do with it. So this is so everything has to get past his desk before it gets to me. So that then I'm insulated in some way from it. So yeah, that was, it was honestly for for something that was you know wasn't my happiest moment when it came to seeing that air. It was great to do it with Ray, and I'm, I spoke to him the other day, and we still tell stories about it. Mm. You know, and um, like that is an awesome experience. Yeah, like just having that. It was thing on the side. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I think that was the hardest thing for me for a long time uh, up until pretty much I've been with with my missus now. Her her and my daughter up until then, I'd always felt that everything Mm. I said, everything I did carried the weight and expectations of an entire army on my shoulders. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I would yeah. have to always be really neutral. Feel in every, like yeah, the representative, yeah, like you, you know, are. cameras in your face, whatever, and it's like yeah, you're always doing on. that. You've always got to put this face on. You've always got to do the be that specific person. And I like, I like the idea that go back to a time when you were doing everything really, really well. You know, when you were mm. performing at your best. What were you doing for me? I was, I was in the army as a commando and I had just realised that all I needed to be was me. And I'm comfortable now that if that's not good enough or that's that's different to what your your ideology is, mm. I don't fucking care because not everyone has to like me and I don't have to like everyone else. You fucking know what I mean? Fucking be you, like, brother. You keep doing that. That's the thing, man. So like, it, And it's really weird, but the whole, the whole political debate that happened mm. in the US, there's a lot of guys who... Like wild supporters of Donald Trump, and I don't really, I don't really lean either way with it. You know, I mean, I don't think he presents well. But one thing I don't agree with is anyone who thinks that a guy right can challenge democracy as a whole, like rig an entire fucking election, but not have enough pull to win that election. Like, what goes through your mind if you think that is possible? Like, seriously, what wonderland do you live in? That just, it it honestly, it blows my mind. But then I had a couple of things on Facebook where I'd sort of just say, they go, oh, you research, you know, you're a slave to mainstream media. And I'm just like, and there's this with this guy. And I'm like, I'm not saying that I've got a huge opinion about which guy is better Mm, or whatever. mm. I'm just saying that you don't know. That's as far as I'm going with it. Tell me about your research. Oh, YouTube. YouTube? So an unvetted video 
that could be posted by anyone yeah. who can put a video together. But then all had, that stuff is a slippery slope, brother. Yeah, it is. Know? But like, and I had like guys, but just attacking me personally about. Oh, really? It. Yeah, and I was just like, okay. yeah, well, because you should believe this because of your background. And I'm like, dude, I'm a guy who grew up on the Central Coast, surfing, not knowing that much about politics, and I still don't. Mm. It fascinates me, but I don't have that type of brain on my shoulders, so I just don't buy into it. No, nah, you, you know got your I mean? lane, and that's yeah, where you are. And that's that's yeah. exactly where I am. But yeah, like, there's yeah. but there's some things about it that I guess, and I don't like that. Again, it's it's a label. Mm. You know, I'm very against that whole yeah 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 concept of you have to fit into this because of you're boxed in whatever. And I'm like, well, no, I don't. I've still got the freedom to, to think and stuff like that. And I think that was sort of something that when I got. Mm out of the army and was finding who I am and what I like and stuff like that. It was a big one to get that, try and have that freedom, mm. you know, of being able to do things. And like, I have no doubt if we were doing the same thing, yeah. like having the same combo and we had it five years ago, I would sound totally different. Yeah, right. So yeah. totally different with everything. Like I would have never, I definitely wouldn't have brought up the process thing. Like all these, all the different yeah. bits, Yeah, you know, which are, they're the nuts and bolts of what makes the story worth telling. Yeah, and who mm. you are. Well, that's it's your journey. Yeah, that's it. And with your journey, Invictus Games, Anzac Spirit, into it, there was a few times that you've competed. But what did you compete in? I've seen some. F- yeah, wheelchair basketball. See, and there's there's another thing. Like I and I just want to say that yeah. shout out to Stuart Sherman. He's someone that I know that I met years ago playing yeah, wheelchair yeah. rugby with. And what I really, you know, I think is awesome got to do about the Invictus Games where it's yeah. like the physical but also the mental part of it with the PTSD and people that have gone through trauma and where they can get into events and have a crack too. It's yeah, inclusivity yeah. for everyone. Everybody's yeah. included. Everybody. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and that, I think one of the good things about it was the Invictus Games really normalised the fact that there was trauma involved and there was going to be some sort of fallout from it, mm. you know, and rather than a, rather than having it as something that you would think you should be ashamed of or it being a sign of weakness or any of the things that you would think that getting pre-battle ready are important things to think mm. really matter the further down the track that you get with it. And, like, it was a really inspiring place to go. Like, it was just the whole... The whole process of, of the, the Amigdus games was cool. But, like, for me, while it did good things, there was this, and I'm going to sound like a bit of a brat, but it was something that just kind of got put on my plate. You know, they asked, did I want to go? Or like, I, I, if I'm representing Australia, there's part of it that makes me, that I want to, like, bust my ass to get there. Mm, mm. You know what I mean? I kind of want the the jersey or something to be a reward yeah yeah for moving through you know like and that was like i well so well, it's just I like love, invictus games you want to have a crack yeah, yeah no you worries. can go here you go we're gonna we're gonna fly you to britain the first ones are there you're meeting prince harry on this day and you're doing these things and this and this and this and i was like there was a bit of it that you know i've always wanted the it just it was like would it be, was it sort of hard because you feel like i should have earned this but then again it's like I've got a platform and I can push this narrative and make it be seen and heard to yeah. the people of Australia and beyond that and representing who I am as, as a person but all the other people in and around me that are in the same boat. Yeah, see, I mean, I, I, that's where I saw a majority of the power in it, you know, and because I, I was uh, one of the few media like sort of personalities that we had at that stage, I was like, okay, I've got I've got a job to do when it comes to showing the world, showing, show, really encapsulating how mm. how we are when we're overseas, when we're competing, and the fun. Like it was, it was a it was a phenomenal experience. Like mm. it was really, really cool. Like of of the things of the things that you do and the way that the UK ran it, like it was just yeah. It was over the moon. You're staying in London as well. You know, it was the best. I, I took I took my dad over there with me. Nice. And yeah, that's that's a cool feeling. You know, that's a cool way of sort of saying sorry to put you through everything. It was like well, here's yeah. Prince Harry, this is, my, this is my dad Steve. You know, and you've got that sort of moment where you're hanging out, having a talk to him yeah. about whatever. Being able to share those bonds with 
you know, with your family because of everything that you guys have gone through. So that's yeah. that's epic. Brother. I mean, and then it's a good it's a good support thing as well. You know, like you stay in contact with people who are in the team. Mm. You know what I mean. And then if they're having a tough time, then it just builds that network. You know, that network of people, which is I think it, it's really really important. You know, I mean, I while that network's important, I think for me, occasionally I wanted to speak to someone who was outside it. You know okay. what I mean? Just like, getting a bit of a different perspective. Yeah, just not – because a lot of the combos that you have to deal with trauma are about trauma. Yep. You know what I mean? Whereas sometimes you just want to forget that it exists. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, And that's what I wanted to ask you just because of – that's so heavy that yourself and your fellow soldiers of and your family, everybody's been through, but – when you're talking about PTSD and trauma and caring for your, you know, for your mental health, if you're a soldier or a civilian, just how important is that like to you and to, you know, if you're going to put a like, message out there? See, I th- mental health is, is such a, I, like we live in a great age right now. We live in such a good age because everyone's acknowledged its existence, mm. which is the first step to dealing with any problem. Mm-hmm. Just acknowledging and accepting the fact it's there, you know, not being in denial of any sort, you know what I mean? And the people who are around you and close to you are typically the ones who, you know, you've, you've got to trust and rely on because mm. if something's really going wrong in, inside your brain, they're the first ones that see it. They're the first ones who can sort of give you a leg up into what, what you're doing and, you know, why, how stuff makes sense, how, how stuff is seen through. Mm. They're sort of rise and they and they care about you know the outcome for you mm. so they're yeah it's, I think we live in a in a really good time where it's at such it's at the forefront yeah of people's trains of thought people I are think, starting to open up a bit more you reckon yeah, and not I think just so. bottle it yeah in I mean well, it's not the eighties it's not one of those times where you were like oh okay this hurts but I'm going to push that down because mm. men don't cry or this doesn't show emotion or I'm going to bottle it up until it pops you know what I mean like yeah. now we're in a time where you can show emotion. You can show that you care about something, which I think is healthy. You know, it's a it's a really healthy thing. And plus, being able to do the simple thing of going, look, I'm just not dealing right now. Mm. And people not going, well, what's wrong with you? People just going, oh, okay, well, let's do something about that. Mm. Let's work out what can I do? You know, I think that, that train of thought is a really healthy one for people to have. If someone just says, look, I'm 100%. not dealing, to be able to say, like, rather than judging, because that's... Yeah. Literally, that's part of the problem of people worrying. What are people going to think about this? Like, I've literally woken up this morning and I don't even know what person woke up. What is wrong with me? Mm. Like, why am I different today? What's happening? You know what I mean? Having people around you that will go, okay, cool. What can I do to help? What will, what will work it out? And I mean, the typical answer is nothing. You know, there's nothing. We can just live it out. Let's sort of see how we roll and then assess the problem as it as it moves along yeah. like it doesn't have to be it a is what it point. is but deal with it you yeah know? but let's work out a way let's work out a way yeah. to deal with it and i think we live in a good time when you can do that and i'm i think that the if you're going to drag a silver lining out of the the war side of things besides advancements in prosthetics and things like mm. that mental health especially for our first responders and stuff like that as well people who see horrific stuff all the time you know everyone kind of gets the benefit of of us going, okay, mental health is such an important thing, mm. you know, which it sounds really odd. I think people are going to look back and just go, so at one stage there was a time where people would be really angry or upset about something and just repress it. That's it. And they would be like, they're buried and that's really not productive. Why were they even doing that? And you're like, because you had specific stuff that you have to do if you're a man or whatever, you know, like, or, or a woman, or you'd have the, there's different standards and blah, 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 and you just look at it and go, it doesn't make any sense. What are you guys doing? Like, mm. yeah. But, mate, I've heard, um, you've done some books in the past too, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wrote one in 2012. I wanted to, um, we got, I got an offer, and then I wanted to really put down, for me, because I still don't think that my story is that, Amazing, I got hurt and I can walk again. You know, that was all it was to me. You know, I didn't see it as inspirational. I didn't see it as yeah. anything. But then when we spoke, we spoke about what we we're going to write down. I, was, I had a, 
I kind of wanted to be able to write something that through my language and the way I tell the story Mm -hmm. kind of showed how frustrating some bits were, how hard bits were, how easy I found bits that you'd think are hard. And I had my family putting down little bits so they had their take. Nice, yeah. On different bits of it as well. And I didn't read any of their bits. I just, I wrote it because I didn't want it to affect what I said. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and I wrote that. It was, um, I used my unit's motto, which is without warning to be the title. And um, yeah, it was cool. At that stage, it's still looking to... As a Paralympic snowboarder, I still wanted to to get to that level, which I never ended up happening. Yeah, I broke my back, my L two. Oh, what snow? Yeah, snowboarding compression fracture, my L two. Uh, like I've literally, I'm probably the luckiest dude ever. Yeah, yeah like, yeah. and it was a big jump to one of the three kings in Park City in Utah. Yeah, right. And I, yeah, so that. At least you were having a crack. Yeah, compression fracture. I rang mum. I remember ringing mum and going, "Mum, I've." Don't freak out, but I broke my back. And any time now I understand what she's thinking. If your kid says don't freak out, the next thing that's getting said is something that's really bad. <laughs> but like after that, I'm like, oh, and I've chipped one of my teeth. And they paid heaps for orthodontics when I was young. So mm. she lost her mind at me. I go, oh, I got your teeth. Why? Just do something that's safe. And I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine called Amy Purdy. She um, did Dancing with the Stars US and she's got two prosthetic legs. Really, really yeah, cool right. okay. great snowboarder. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know how sometimes you know something but mm. you don't think it? Right, okay. Like I was talking to her at one of the bars. We were doing a thing. And I'm like, oh, you know, blah, 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 blah. I said, but, you know, I'm kind of thinking of giving, the, giving snowboarding away even before such. I'm not sure. She goes, why? And I'm like, I just don't want to wake up in hospital and have a doctor tell me this time you can't learn to walk again. Uh, And I was literally, I heard myself say it and it was literally like I was watching myself say it. You're going through the air and you can... Yeah, and I'm like... That's going through your head. (laughs) I just wanted to put my head around to the front of myself and go, did you just say that? Yeah. And yeah. But the thing is, man, like, you know, you're not wrapped in cotton wool. You're still having a crack, so. Yeah. I mean, it was good. It was good. It was good, but I needed a different direction, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, So it was no boarding anymore? No. Well, there were, like, for me to race snowboards, I've got significant physical injuries. And despite the motivation that guys in that world gave me, me to be jumping tabletops with the type of legs i'm running Mm. or any type of leg that you're running is really difficult it's like you live on ibuprofen yeah it just destroys you yeah physically it wrecks you so i had to find i had to find something else that was i guess that could scratch all the itches and boom which is a golf club but before we get into that i want to touch on hacksaw ridge and just is it true like what they say in the media about Mel Gibson? Is he as mad as a cut snake or no, what? He's a legend, man. He's a legend, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like literally you could sit there for hours and chat yeah. to him about anything, man. He's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like... What was that like, that whole experience? Mel Gibson? Like it. Vince what, Vaughn? Yeah. Where did Sam Andrew Worthington? Garfield? Yeah, Garfield. Yeah. Um, like Luke Bracey... Ben Minge, all the Aussie guys, Faraz, Frastrani, he was awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. He was yeah. great. Like, so there was all guys that I've watched in different things. And then all of a sudden, like, because I went to acting school for two years just as a, because I was like, I want to do something that is going to challenge me and I don't care what that's people think. That's awesome. Anymore. You're putting the work in. Yeah. 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 yeah so I was like, I because I wanted to do it because when I was young, I probably would have done, I probably would have been an actor, except I cared too much what people thought. So if I made a mess of something, Like, and that's the gift of being in prosthetics. Mm. You know what I mean? If something was hard or if I had this injury, right, was I can't control what people think of me. Mm. You know what I mean? I don't, I have little or no impact in what they think. So why care? Mm. Why have I always lived my life caring about what people think? Why when I got qualified, one of the, like as a commando, the most self-satisfying thing, I was like, well, that'll show them. Mm. That'll show who? Who that matters on a Sunday, for God's sake. Like, and that was, so to counter that, I went to an acting school. I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to I'm gonna study this and go through. And I, a couple of years in, I had one of the teachers just goes, mate, Nikki Barrett's casting something. You going to manage her? And I said, yeah. And he goes, get, get him to give her a call. She's the biggest, probably the biggest casting agent in Australia, I think. 
Yeah, right. Okay. And I'm like, so yeah, I'll just get him to call her. Like, it's just, so, what are you talking about, bro? And it's, but he wrote an email and he goes, look, you got a screen test. I went down, I read the thing. I was like, okay, I know what I got to do. Mm-hmm. Walked in with little or no expectations. Just kind of did the the bit that I needed to in my best at the time American accent. And, um, and yeah, she goes, you know, we might have something for you. Well, yeah, I'm going to talk to them. So, okay, cool. I still didn't know what it was. And then my manager rings and I'm walking along Lake Coogee Beach and he calls and he goes, hey, man, how you going? I'm like, oh, not bad. What's doing? He's like, oh, you got the part. I'm like, what in? And he's like, oh, the, you know, the movie that you screen tested for the other day. I said, yeah, yeah. He goes, oh, you got it. And I said, oh, cool. It's he's not like, sinking in. And he goes, so, mate, you got it. You're on the speakerphone. You know that. And I'm like. Okay, so I'm either getting fired or what's happening? Okay, what? What? It's just a, it's a war film or whatever. He goes, man, you know you did an American accent. I'm like, yeah. And he goes, Mel Gibson's directing it. And I'm like, are you, you fucking bl- kidding? Just blew your ah! shit. <laughs> so I've started like yelling down yeah, at Koji yeah, yeah, yeah. and the yeah. girl I was with at the time I like, like looked at her and go this is so good I got in this film and Mel Gibson's directing and no word of a lie she looked at me and goes who's she <laughs> yeah Mel Gibson oh, like, come on Mel Gibson Braveheart like come on Braveheart like all of them it's the lethal, lethal weapon oh god it's everything and yeah yeah um, but then Riggs yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then when we when we get there it was just it was so surreal. We did a week of army, like, training stuff. Mm. And the guy who was the armourer hired a guy from my unit, so I already knew him. So I walked, hey, Tony, how you going, man? Good to see you. And they're like, oh, this is the other guy who's doing all the training. His name's John Isles. He's, um, he's in Mad Max. He's the guy in one of the sequences that grabs Carmen Electra by the throat when they're driving the trucks. Ah, and he's, right. his lip down the left side kind of... Drops like Popeyes did. Yeah, okay. And I re- you always will remember the way that he looks. And he was on one of the domestic okay. counter-terror things that we did, so I knew him from work as well. Yep, yep, yep. So I'm like, hey, John, how you going? I was working in the rib thing and blah, blah, blah when you were doing that. So when we get there, there was all of these actors, which are just larger than life, but the, all the military connections, I've got that. And I kind mm. of felt like I'm like, okay, cool. I'm now a bit more comfortable with it. And right. like then we so we went through the military training that they had to do to get them into the zone that got And how would that feel because you're doing it on the like with prosthetics now and Well I didn't have to do half like a lot of the stuff. I didn't want to, I could just go, Yeah, okay, I'm just gonna buy the prosthetics. Ah, whatever. Yeah. You yeah, could yeah, kinda yeah. do that and then they'd all be yeah. marching around the field or doing whatever and yep. you hear like Vince laughing and doing stuff. He's <laughs> he's phenomenal. We were doing a funny a dude in real yeah, life. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. so cool. But then to have, it's so surreal to be having conversations with him. Just having a general yarn. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah, and yeah. then you just, we talking about stuff and he was just, he was, he just had a kid that just worked it out. He was talking about the timing of it and all these different things. And that's why it's hard being in Australia at this time and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, right. It was, but it was funny watching him do one of the sequences, which is sort of like Full Metal Jacket, where he's walking up and down saying all these things and then he sort of looked and goes yeah can we go off book now and i was like yeah yeah cool and then he walks up and just starts ripping people apart it was hilarious like you're trying to be pro- as professional as you can but man the dude's just he's so funny like he honestly and he's just witty and sharp with everything he does and then that's awesome. it was just just to watch it happening as well like you've watched yeah. movies and stuff like that and then you're in one you're across from Andrew Garfield or you're next to him or you And then you got Mel in the director's chair just yeah, pointing and him getting the action like, going. And the producers were really cool to me because there was bits where if people are moving a lot in them, there's mm. no point having me in it because it looks awkward. So I'd go and be able to sit with them in Video City. Okay. So you know, I'm talking to Bill Mechanic, who I'm still friends with, you know, we still send each other messages and stuff. Mm. He was the head of Fox when they did like Titanic, when they did... Yeah, you know, right. done some. So he was telling stories when we went out for dinner one night about when Celine Dion brought the tape. That were like that were five weeks out from the release of that before she brought the tape in. That goes, yeah, I did this in the garage on my eight track. <laughs> That's when they got the main song, her song, the Heart Will Go On song. 
Really? Yeah, and he goes, I've still got that that sits in my office. What? And it's his thing because he thought all hope was lost. You know, like just having those conversations with people is just mind-blowing. Like I was sitting there talking to – like I, I love chatting to Sam Worthington. Okay. I just thought it was cool. Like all of the stuff that I've seen him do, like getting square, he was just great in – like I love all, that movie. Yeah, like all of these different things that he'd done. I'm just like, it's so cool. Yeah. So I'm sitting there talking to him and he was talking about the ins and outs of what the business looked like and this and that. And he goes, one of the best jobs. And giving I've you done. the heads up and how it all works and all that yeah, sort of stuff. Yeah, little bits of that. Inside of knowledge. Yeah, and like one of the things, but that he sort of goes, oh, and I got this really good job, which only took us a little while, but it was, you know, it was just a voiceover part. And when he said it, I'm just like, it's what? Call of Duty 3. He's Mason. Oh. I didn't even realise that he'd done the Call of Duty voiceover yeah. until he said it. And yep. then I was just like, oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. That's, wow. Do you, it's just mind-blowing. Do you know what's tripped out when with Sam Worthington, like my accident, I, the week before my accident, I yeah. was watching Avatar. Yeah. And you've got Sam Worthington. In the wheelchair. Jake. He's wow. in the wheelchair. And then a week after. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yep. Dude, watch a movie about Lotto. Watch a movie about winning money. Yeah. Just think it into happening. Yeah. You've got that power. Yeah. Like it's, push, push, yeah. push. <laughs> I'm going to project it yeah. until it exists. Mate, so passion. Golf. Swinging golf clubs. Golf the whole way. It takes. That amazes me. Like when I've seen a, a picture of you swinging a club, I'm like, I'm thinking of your, your core strength, your balance. Like, how, what was that like just trying to get that in tune? Like, because golf for anyone is hard enough, let alone if you're trying to. Yeah. The, you know? I, my parents had played it the whole time. I'd played it beforehand. Like, I'd done a fair bit of golf work. And um, there's a. Like, it was when I got a specific prosthetic foot okay. that I was really like, I can make this work. You know, I was 100%. Like, I can really, really make this work. Like, this will be good. And then I had, um, I decided I wanted to play competitive. You know, and now I, I don't wear shorts anywhere. I wear jeans everywhere except when I'm playing golf because I want mm -hmm. the guy who I'm beating to know who's beating him. You know, I wanted to see it, and that's my goal is to you know, it's to be the, the show best show ability world. within disability. Yeah, brother. that's it. You know, if someone's gonna start saying, "Oh, yeah, it's a really, it's a really good thing that you're out here playing golf," I'm like, oh. cool. What's your handicap, but are you twelve, dude? <laughs> getting a single figures, then let's have this conversation. <laughs> you know, like those those type of things. I yeah. think it it empowers me to you know feel good about myself. Plus, introduce me to I think the a group of guys who have all got the same passion. I mean, deep down, I'm a, I'm a competitor and yep. I needed that. I'd rather be competitive on a golf course than competitive working out who's going to get into a merging lane first. Mm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. my competitive drives then focused in one, in one spot. And um, I mean, I'm ranked 43rd in the net in the world now. Um, but Solid in the, work. In the gross, I'm about 100 and... 140 something so mm. a couple of events that have got to come off i should be in the top 100 pretty easy by the end of the year yeah good on you and i know man covid has taken a hit on everyone when it's got to do with sport and getting around and you know and that would have affected obviously travel and rankings and all that sort of stuff yeah yeah a little bit like it's just held the tournaments that would have previously come off haven't and they've still got a couple of months but now we've got you know, stuff's, stuff's pretty much started up again, but it gave me a chance when Melbourne are locked down. My main competitor is a double amputee, is Mike Rolls, and he was locked down in Melbourne. So every day I'm out working, like training as hard as I can. He's not, you know, and I like that. That mm. makes me go there. It makes me turn up and know that I'm working then harder than, than Mike is. You're you know putting in, I mean? you're getting the swings in, you're yeah. getting the... You're getting, getting the hours in. Getting the reps in. And I think that's what matters. Like, and it's given me something that for me moving forward, the goal is to get just a little bit better every day. You know, to be better tomorrow because of something I did today. 
That's it. You know, no matter what it is, just make sure that I'm doing something that's going to add something, another foundation for me to be able to build on and move forward. And goal's given me a perfect blueprint to that. You know, I think the game, to me, represents things that in the past I haven't done well. You know, I've got to be patient and mm -hmm. I've got to work hard. Getting it right once doesn't mean that I have the technique to get it right every so time. You being know, cerebral I, about yeah, your approach. Yeah, that's yeah. it. So I've really got to do a lot of those things. And I see it as being able to find – I've found a sport that allows me to work on all of my weaknesses in the one spot. That's awesome. So, yeah, it's good, man. Paralympics on the horizon? If golf's ever accepted into it, I want to, yeah. Yeah. That's it. That, yeah. So, yeah, and I mean that – to me that will – that will mean the most because I've earned that jacket. Like at the moment, there's got at least seven or eight other Australians that I know are going to fight tooth and nail to be there too. And there's only two people that are going to get to go. Mm. So the way I see it, I've probably got three years before it's maybe accepted. Yeah. So okay. three years to be the best in Australia, which is... Uh, my handicap's at seven now, so that probably handicap-wise puts me in the top, easily in the top ten, maybe close to the top five. Yeah, five or yeah, prop, but top ten at the moment, which is just not, it's not good enough, but it's close. Get those reps in, brother. Yeah, You'll get there. That's the thing, man. I'll, I'll grind until I get there. But Dude, we're getting there. So before we roll and wrap this up, got four pictures, four photos that I've gotten off general media and social. So yeah, yeah. I'm going to show you them and then you explain what they are <laughs> and to the viewers and listeners, all right? Yeah, okay. Okay, right. Hold on. Stand by. Stand by. Slowly pull this up. Yeah, yeah. Hold oh, have I got orientation lock on? Hold on. Stand by. It's off. Hold on. Hold on. What's going on? Two seconds. Come on, stuff, yeah. Orientation lock off. Right, now yeah, we're sweet. Bang. Righto. This bloke, I just want to say something before you. Explain what's going on in, in this photo. Right, I'm a Dragons fan, so <laughs> it, looks, it looks like it is an Anzac Anzac Day Anzac Day game where that you blokes have just got flogged. Is that the look on your face that, or what? That, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that was the, that was the one that got washed out. <laughs> um, no, that was that was press that we did for the for the Roosters for their grand final when Sonny was playing. So it was the 2012, oh, 2012 I remember grand that. final. He signed that jersey. I've really? got that jersey. Yeah, I framed it. It's going in my man cave. Nice. So, yeah. Shout out, Sonny Bill. Yeah, legend. Righto. This bloke with the red hair, what's going on? I heard uh, he likes a party. Eh? That, yeah, that's Harry, his name is now. Rather oh, than is it? Prince Harry. Yeah, he's um, previously known as Prince Harry. Yeah, I heard his family doesn't like him that much anymore. You probably have to ask his grandmother. Yeah, he's the, he's the red sheep. Um, he's, we'd actually had a conversation right before that photo was taken about he had the Foo Fighters and he had Ed Sheeran play in the Invictus Games at the, the – sorry, the – Closing, the closing ceremony. Yeah, right. So, and he was talking about whether Ed Sheeran was too flat. Did Ed Sheeran make the crowd too flat before the Foo Fighters pumped it up at the end? Ah, oh, right. So he actually, he, that was the, a really cool moment because you're knowing that Prince Harry cares about what's happening. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's kind of like, he's really has a vested interest. It's not just a name attached to the event. No, he really... Gives a he, damn about what's it. going on. He was hanging out with everyone in the little level in the bit that we were. So that's afterwards we're having a the little beer that you can see down the bottom. Yeah, I know, he's sneaking well, in That's there. his little beer, yeah. I think. Hopefully yeah. he's still involved with the Invictus Games going forward. I hope eh? he will be, yeah. Yeah, hope so. Anyway, oh, what's next? next one. This bloke. Andrew Garfield. He what was that? Just You bring it up before, but talk about this bloke, this scene, and... And what that felt like, because obviously going what you went through. It was like it was cathartic in a way, mm -hmm. um, but it was also 
difficult. I mean, there was, my main concern was make it look real, you know, make it look real. And I knew at that stage when I talked to producers, they're like, Andrew's going to be in the run for an Oscar, you know, if he pulls this one off the way it should. So my whole thing when I was working with him on that was to give him the grounds to have the best performance he could, Mm -hmm. you know, so he had to believe it. You know, so, which is good. I mean, there was a couple of times we'd finish the take and he'd be like rub my chest going, you, okay, and like, yeah, man, let's go again. You know, let's get the tears cleaned up and do it again. It was a, yeah, right. it was a long day, but yeah, I didn't realize there was stuff in there that I think needed to come out that was, yeah, God, they got to. Dude. You know, it was, yeah, it was, re- it was really cool. That's, yeah. You know, it was mad. That's making. And, and just to be. Just to be, just to be there as well, like to know, like when, you know, it's just the bit I'll always sort of look when they're doing the shorts of Hacksaw Ridge and when he's okay. like that scene where he's like, I'm on get you home to like know what it's like to be under him when he's saying it. Oh, it did. It was an awesome movie. You know what I mean? It, yeah. And it was just cool to be involved in telling a story like that about such a guy. Like yeah. I know what a square block looks like. A square okay. block trying to go in a round hole in the army is not the place you want to be, yeah. you know, but. Yeah, it was re- it was really cool, man. Yeah, made the hair stand up on the back of oh. man. These guys. These guys. That's my missus. My missus it's Abby. Beautiful, brother. Yeah, and my baby girl Isla. She's she's so cute, man. She's the best. Honestly, there's nothing like. I'm really glad that I got I got to do everything that I ever could have wanted to do. Like I've got yep. to live the life that you know you could fit. My experiences into ten different people's lives, you know what I mean. And then I got to do all of that, and now I get the best bit where I can just focus on them, you know what I mean. Which um is just awesome, it's, man. It's the coolest thing ever. I've never been so excited every single day just to see what someone's gonna do, you know what I mean. Just her, every, everything that she does is to me is just the. It blows my mind. I've never felt anything like it. It's the best. It's the best thing ever. We've got Just another the one. Little things. Yeah, yeah, we've got another thing due in another thing, another little baby due in June, which is just. It's so. It's the best thing ever. People talk about it and they rave about it, and I don't think I was ready until this until mm. we had had Isla. But like, it just it's the the best thing yeah. ever and I mean it reminds me all the time how lucky I am that mm. I had such good people around me to keep me here yep. through everything that happened because that's the only reason why I'm here it's not you know there's no pat on the back to go for me it's literally like it's a collection of amazing people that have done great stuff to be able to have me be able to do what I'm doing now which is just living you know I mean it's and there's a lot of hands that have been moving from a lot of different places that gave me the chance to sort of see that. And that's every single time I look at her, that's like what I see. Mm. You know, I see the people who didn't give up on me. I see the people who were still around me who helped when things weren't easy, when they were perceived in media to be easy and they weren't. You know, when I'm falling apart on the inside, the people who helped me stay back together. You know, my my missus, um, I she was the, the first the first date that we had was literally so that I could go out with someone who hadn't seen anything that had happened on TV or didn't have any of those questions. They just wanted to have a talk about what we used to do because we lived in the same street when we grew up and then we went to high school together. Ah. Yeah, it's crazy, hey? And then, yeah. Dude. So it's, and it was just good to, to have that conversation with you, you know what I mean? And then, yeah, things, things blossom from there and it's just, I'm, I don't think I could be in a better place than now, you know, it, which is, I think that's when you know that you're in the right spot mm. when you literally can't add something that would work that would make it any better you know so and that just physically physically emotionally the work so I'm, yeah you know i'm a really 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 lucky person brother well said mate you're kicking continuously kicking goals like no, really enjoyed just yourself coming down here and having a yarn. And I don't know if they've made that those legs out of titanium, but you're just kicking kicking <laughs> stuff through the stratosphere, bro. I'm telling you. But with like if with your social media and and tell the folks out there like 
to do with your your golf and like contributions and everything else that um, people can like look on your website and hold on, I'll repeat that. Man, I got pretty overwhelmed when you said that last part, you know. Dude. That's it, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, so, brother, thanks a lot for coming down here. Much appreciated. Yeah, not a problem. Not a problem at all. I really enjoyed talking, mate. It's been... Yeah. It's kind of good. I, like I said, I don't think many people can, like, connect before mm. they've met the way that people who have both been through something in their life do. So it yeah. makes it easy for me to have someone I can easily open up to about things i mean i'm uh, yeah i really appreciate having it down i mean the social media if people want to find it they'll they'll find out where i am or they'll whatever, find man. it yeah as long as they keep listening to your show well, that's enough payment they got to give me that's it brother well, well said you know i can't wait to you know see how you come up within the rankings hopefully with see, golf yeah. you know one one day it might be caddy mate you can just rig the bag up to the back of the chair i'll wheel alongside you there we go it sounds yeah. good and Mate, hope everything goes well with the youngster that's going to be coming out into the world. Awesome. Hope it's all smooth sailing. Brother, much appreciated. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Beauty. See you, bro. Man, solid yarn, eh? We could have kept going. And I look forward to having a yarn with him again, just with what he's accomplished and what he keeps pushing to do whether it's through the Australian Army on the disability front for his adaptive golf. Yeah, he's swinging it. He's sending it, that's for sure. Love your work, brother. Keep it up. And if you liked the podcast, hit that subscribe button. It'd be much appreciated. And if you want to help the channel even further, I've got a Patreon page. So if you want to become a part of the squad, hit the link below. That would be great. And if you want to get in contact with me, you can get me via Instagram at Street Rolling Cheetah or email one word Street Rolling Cheetah at gmail.com. And we've also got a Facebook page, Keep Rolling with Jake Briggs, so check it out. And I want to thank our sponsors, Permanville Australia, the greatest electric wheelchairs in the land. Wouldn't be sitting in anything else but these four wheels right here. They've got great assistive tech also. So, righto. See you on the next one.